Hello, everybody, and congratulations on surviving two full minutes of 80s dad rock as we build up to the show. Welcome to The Hangup right here on the line. I'm Matt Delaney. Hope you guys are doing well. And one of the things is The Hangup. What's my hangup today? Well, it's got a lot to do with faith and philosophy. Uh, for those that have known me uh, for many years, I do spend a lot of time uh, I'm an obsessive learner, but I try to share that in teaching some aspects. And so I spent a lot of time talking about um, philosophical issues and epistemology. I recently put up a a, a kind of half joking um, video on my personal channel, and you can find that on YouTube uh, at, with Sans.Deity, or you can go to patreoncom debates and support that there. Um, but it was about the Raven paradox and God. And it, it's, it's a bit of amusement because I just wanted people to know that if you're going to use some sort of, um, I'm, I'm being cautious with my language, philosophical trick to prove something, uh, that can backfire spectacularly, which we might end up talking about today. I've been doing research on a number of different things because people were asking me to sort of rework my foundations series that I did on YouTube um, way more than a decade ago at this point. Uh, you might find them. They're really old. I had a bright pink beard, and it was back when I was doing Drive Home Brain Dump, um, which was I had a 45-minute drive, and I would take my cell phone, point it at me, and while I was on that drive, I would talk about what was on my mind and what I'd been researching and what I thought of it that day or you know anything like that. And one of the things that I did was I did some kind of very basic uh, intro to philosophy stuff about um, identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle, uh, about the foundations of epistemology, about where I was. And as I was telling my guests just before, um, I'm a huge fan and proponent of David Hume. I've, I've said many times that that's all you need to read. If you're not going for a philosophy degree of some sort, if you're not looking to expand into a particular field within philosophy, that if all you cared about was being a skeptic and and digging in on epistemology, Hume might be all you needed to actually read. Not that he's got everything right, but I have a hard time finding uh, problems with that. And then when it comes to epistemology, as I've mentioned before, I would, I need to stop saying I'd love to get her on the show and just send her an email or reach out to her through a mutual friend. But Susan Hawk is a philosopher who uh, essentially uh, created foundherentism, which is a, a, a union of foundationalism and, and coherentism that I find comes closest to explaining where I'm at on, on this issue in epistemology. I was doing research to redo my foundation series um, and included, I was going to go through a number of different paradoxes, not just the Raven one that I put up the other day, but I was doing some research on the knowability paradox. And I stumbled across a, a gentleman who's here tonight, um, Kane B is a PhD philosopher who has a YouTube channel with somewhere in the neighborhood of 50,000 subscribers, tons of great content up there. Um, I'm, I'm pouring through it uh, video by video as we go through it. But I was also impressed that he also offers um, private tutoring as well. And so I I'm, I'm basically have conned him into tutoring all of us for a little bit tonight in the hopes that some of you will reach out. And if you have an interest in this, maybe see if he's available uh, and willing uh, to engage in some tutoring there. But at a minimum, you guys need to check out his channel and get a really all right, well put together plain. It's like it's like watching a, 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 a pleasant PowerPoint from someone who really understands something, explaining it in a way where you're going to be able to understand it too. And that was really refreshing to me. So I reached out right off the bat and said, hey, you know, if you've got time, I'd love to get you on the show and talk about this because I have a bunch of questions. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I have tons of other friends who are philosophers, and I can't always get them on the show, although they, like half of my philosopher friends are all in the UK. So it's like evidently there's nothing to do in the UK except become a philosopher and then stay up all night uh, in order to do shows. So we'll uh, we'll see about getting some of the others on there. But on the Sunday show, there was someone who sat on hold with for, for like an hour 
um, with a question that was designed to challenge me, and that's fine. They were a theist by virtue of opposition, and their primary position was that naturalism is untenable, logically self-contradictory. It's a non-starter. I don't remember exactly how they phrased it, but because of this, naturalism must be false. Therefore, therefore what? Well, something not naturalism must be true. And they were going to use this for theism. Now, I already have my thoughts on it, but because I've been spending so much time doing prep work for uh, kind of a little primer from, I'm not a philosopher, wouldn't ever claim to be, a little bit of a philosophy geek. I, I, I like the parts that I like. I understand the parts that I understand, but I want to understand more of it. And before we get to tonight's guest, who's going to help us with a few things, I want to say, first of all, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And as a reminder, this is not the only show on the Line Network. The Line Network is designed specifically uh, to allow for call-in shows, and this is one of them. The number will appear on the screen below. There's also a link down underneath the video for how you can connect using your computer. There'll be call screeners who have already started going through calls. And because it's a show hosted by me, theist callers and anyone who's advocating for supernatural beliefs will always have priority. You'll always go to the top of the queue. And tonight, um, and most nights, if there's a guest on for a particular subject, in this case, faith and philosophy, uh, if your calls are specifically about that, you will be basically second in the queue. And everybody else uh, who's calling in to talk about stuff we've talked about 500 times or whatever else, you can still get through the queue as well. But I want to make sure that we have priority both for theists as always and for guests. Now, for those who don't know, this is my Wednesday night show, The Hang Up, where I often talk about political issues as much or more uh, than religion or philosophical issues. Um, who knows what we'll get to tonight. But there are a number of other programs here on the Line Network. Uh, tomorrow is the Transatlantic Call-In Show with Katie Montgomery and Arden Hart. Basically, your OG um, Transatlantic hosts will be together again tomorrow. Now, that's starting at 2 p.m. Central because, of course, Katie's in the UK. And if you are transphobic and proud of it, you should call in. If you've been accused of being transphobic and you don't understand why, you should call in. If you have questions about trans issues, trans rights, and all that stuff, you should call in. If you are the parent of someone uh, who's recently told you or suggested they might be trans, you should call in. And if you're a trans person with a different point of view or with a perspective that's been informed by different life experiences that you think the audience could benefit, you should call in too. Uh, and it's really wild for me to be sitting here telling you who should call into somebody else's show. But it's your opportunity to actually have a discussion with two real live trans people who have been dealing with these issues and educating people on these issues for quite a long time now. And so if you want to be better and understand better, whether you're trying to be an ally or just not be awful or you're confused about, you know, how I can... Uh, tour with and do engagements with Richard Dawkins and genuinely like him and agree with him on a number of things and then also call him out for his transphobic statements. That can happen there to, on Tacus as well. Uh, in addition to that show and this show, on Sunday, uh, we do the Sunday show, which is primarily focused on religious callers, people if you're calling in to defend your faith, some of which may happen at night, but that's the, the, the primary show for religious issues is the Sunday show. I'll be back on the Sunday show this weekend with Jimmy. Um, Monday is Skeptalk, and our host on Monday is our new regular host, Erica, also known as Gutsick Gibbon. And so if you have questions about skepticism, about science specifically related to biology, uh, Erica is an amazing uh, source for that. This last Monday on Skeptalk, it was uh, John Gleason, and I've forgotten who John's guest was. Who's, who's on with him, Martin? Uh Atheologica is the channel. I'm blanking on the name because I wasn't expecting Derek. Derek Bennett. Derek right, from yeah. Atheologica was on with with uh, John Gleason. So if you missed Sundays, you can do that. And next Wednesday, uh, Brady Goodwin's going to be back with me here on the Hang Up uh, to talk about a number of things. Tonight's call screener is uh, Dragon, and we have cookies and skeptics and scoundrels and countless other people in there doing moderation in the channel. For that, we're all very welcome. I want to make one last announcement, and that is about line merch. Now, 
here we are starting 2024. We had a big mug mug battle um, and all, all of those mugs should be, uh, well, we've got our mugs. I'm assuming other people got their mugs, but we had a basically a competition. And of course, Forrest won by just having some milk toast statement about science rather than anything, you know, awesome like Arden's dimples or my Santa beard phase. Uh, but, you know, we, we figured Forrest would probably win. I mean, I, I wanted Forrest's mug too. We're moving on and it's 2024. And let me tell you, if, first of all, if you're not supporting us on Patreon already, you can go to patreon.com slash call the line and support there. Patrons get a discount code for merchandise at line merch. And so you can go to linemerch.com. In addition to what's been up there before, there are now mugs, t-shirts, and this kind of hoodie jumper thing. Um, this is just a, the, the cup is just a generic, the line cup that is now dishwasher safe because there were some people who were concerned that some of the previous ones might not have been. So you're there and the t-shirts just a you're on the line t-shirt. That is the, the first offering there, uh, to have, con, uh, you know, things for people to grab. Uh, the other things you may not be able to see this very clearly, uh, on your screen. I hope you can, cause I love this, this advertisement, that hoodie has the, the phone icon from uh, the line, and then it has uh, GFY uh, for Jimmy and YGH for me. And so we love those things. Now, first of all, these hoodies are limited edition. They are expensive to produce and they are not cheap. And so that's why we're also offering cups and mugs and other things it, for you guys to get. Uh, we, I'm not expecting anyone and everyone to buy one of these hoodies. I will of course have one, um, hoodie, jumper, whatever you want to see. Are we speaking the King's English? Good one, Lewis. Um, so that's all available right now. And if you're a patron, you will have a new discount code, um, that went out over Patreon, I think earlier today. Um, but I'm not positive, uh, on the details of how you're supposed to get that code. But I was told by Jimmy today that that code is now updated for patrons on that note. Please join me in welcoming my guest for tonight, Kane B. Welcome, sir. How are you doing? Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. It's um, so, so glad we managed to work it out for you to get down here. How did you first kind of develop your interest in philosophy that led to you, you know, not only getting a PhD in the subject, but in, in educating people about it and creating uh, the, the content that you've been doing? Well, um, I am not entirely sure. My life just went in that direction, uh, and I, I don't really, um, I, I don't really make plans for my future, right? Or think much about my past. I'm very much somebody who tends to live in the present. So, you know, I'm sort of making it. I, I, I'll try to answer the question, but it, I'm, it might not really be true. Uh, but. Um, I think that, yeah, when I was a teenager, I just had an interest in some of these sorts of issues. I had an interest in the sorts of questions that philosophers seem to be asking. And then I know there was at some point I had to make the decision of what I was going to do after school. And I didn't really want to, you know, get a real job. So I decided to, uh, you know, well, I'll just keep I'll keep on studying, uh, go to university. And uh, and then I continued not wanting to get a real job. So I just continued, uh, continued studying the philosophy. Um, and I mean, that's, pre that's pretty much it. You know, there, there wasn't really, um, there wasn't really much more to it than, oh, I happen to be really interested in this subject and I seem to be pretty good at it and I'm able to do it. So I might as well. Uh, and, and then we end up here. <laughs> so, yeah, now, we, we spoke briefly, we met just, you know, 30 minutes or so before we were going live today. Um, this is, this is interesting and fun for me because I, I kind I come at this from kind of a side perspective. Um, I was a fundamentalist Christian studying to be a minister, found my way out, got involved in atheist activism and, um, and skepticism and then humanism as well. Um, and by skepticism, I'm specifically talking about the kind of the modern scientific skepticism, you know, I was, I was fortunate to get to work with James Randi just a little bit. Um, but 
I found when I got, when I could no longer hold on to the religious beliefs that I was raised with, um, I used to joke that once I figured out I couldn't be a Bible-believing literalist Christian, that I wandered through a number of different uh, views, and then I decided, oh, well, uh, how do I figure out which of these gods or which of these religions might actually be correct? And how do I even direct my search? Because there's far too many religions for me to spend a great deal of time studying. So I joked that I started with Buddhism to find out if maybe I would have multiple lives to do this in, or if I had to do it all in, in one. And that's what led me to kind of dig in on epistemology and, and science, and particularly philosophy of science stuff, because it was, hey, wouldn't it be nice to know what kind of God might exist to help kind of narrow my focus or, or direct my, my inquiry so that I could say, you know, all of these ones that are advocating for, you know, a personal God with these characteristics, okay, we can shelve those. And it led me to a point where I never really had to go back to any specific religions, although I, I did study a number of them specifically to address uh, the claims uh, from, from uh, advocates of those beliefs. But it was such an interesting pursuit to figure out, okay, what do we know? How do we know it? How do we know what we know? How do we know mm -hmm. if we know? Is truth, you know, even accessible? I, I, you know, I remember when the Matrix movie came out, and I've spoken about this before, uh, other people were were like, oh my gosh, this is so awesome. And I was sitting there going, this is a really cool movie. Oh, they're doing solipsism. I just got done kind of getting a basic understanding of this. How do you tell if you're a brain in Nevada, et cetera? But right. what came up the other day, and probably the first question that we can try and address here, is there's a distinction that I make. I don't know how many philosophers dig in on it. Between philosophical naturalism, which... I've always understood as the position that the natural world is in fact all that exists and methodological naturalism, which is a softer, more directed version, which says the natural world is currently all we're able to robustly explore. If there's something beyond the natural world, um, we, we certainly can't say it doesn't exist, but we don't know how to investigate it. When I get calls from theists, and there was a call like this on Sunday that we didn't get to take they hung up before we got there and I, I hope maybe they'll call back the principal part of that call was that philosophical naturalism is logically self-contradictory or has no foundation um is philosophical naturalism which i don't hold to because i don't know how to defend it is it just broken I mean, well, if you're asking if, if it's uh, logically contradictory, I'm not entirely sure why that would be. I mean, um, I, I don't think it is. I can kind of imagine some arguments that you might give for that position. I mean, so what you so the sort of thing that strikes me initially is you could say, well, philosophical naturalism is is a theory, right? Like it says something, it has some sort of content. It's making a claim about the world that could be true or false. And there are some people who say that, um, that like content uh, of that sort, um, you know, like saying something, um, exp like having meaning, for instance, is something that can't be, uh, that can't be sort of given a natural, that we can't give a naturalistic account of that. Um, so maybe you could say that it's logically contradictory for that sort of reason. Uh, but I don't know if that's what that person had in mind. Um, so, I mean, on, on that point, I guess I would just say I'd, I'd have to see what the argument is. I, I've never yeah. seen an argument that I think is a convincing case for taking it to be logically contradictory. I think maybe, uh, you know, a, a more serious problem, although this is perhaps a problem for both philosophical naturalism, as you put it, and uh, methodological naturalism, is not so much a problem about it being logically contradictory, but just a problem about, well, what the hell is it for something to be natural? Like what, like what exactly is a natural property? Um, you know, if we're saying that all that exists is natural, uh, or we're saying that all we can know about is the natural stuff, then we're going to want to give some sort of account of what exactly it is for a property to be a natural property. And I think there are, you know, there are, there are difficulties making that precise. Um, 
So, you know, we, we might sort of say, well, the natural properties are just the properties that are, you know, postulated in, uh, in, in our best sciences or something like that. But we probably don't want to say that that's all that exists or that that's all we can know about because, well, we expect that science is going to change in the future. Um, so I don't know, maybe we say, well, the natural properties are just those properties that will be discovered by science, you know, at the, at the end of inquiry or something along those lines. Like if science was to carry on for as long as possible, um, then it would discover the natural properties. But I, I don't know. I mean, like, it seems like there could be, couldn't there be sort of, you know, things in the universe, natural properties that are just, you know, beyond our ability to investigate. Um, and in any case, we don't really know exactly what science is going to look like in the future. So right. that sort of thing might be an issue, right? We might have a problem with specifying exactly what counts as a natural property, and that might be a problem. Um, so I think, yeah. and, and I wish, you know, by the way, if you're that caller and you're watching now, feel free to call back because I don't want to, despite what some people say, I do, I'm not here to misrepresent people's views, but one of the most common objections on, on this is that somehow naturalism lacks grounding is, and, and I never can get to exactly what it means. Um, but it's when we're talking about, for example, the presuppositionalist uh, theists are advocating that. Oh, identity, non-contradiction, exclude the middle, if you want to use that as a, a, a trifold foundation of reason, doesn't have any grounding. It's just a presupposition. And my thing is, okay, so what? Um, I'm, I'm presupposing something that when put into practice consistently demonstrates its usefulness at creating uh, what seems to be an accurate model of reality. And it also, even though I can't show that it is that those things are always true, or that they're inviolate and uniform across space and time and everything else, they certainly seem to be, and you would have to assume they're true in order to try to demonstrate that they're false. So the presuppositionalists want to say that they're, they want, they're presupposing a God to serve as a justification for identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle, like that, and that naturalism, setting aside identity for a moment that naturalism lacks any sort of grounding and that supernaturalism can then be grounded in god do do you have a view on on this notion of grounding i i don't want to i can't saddle you with it if i don't have somebody here to defend it and i can't defend it but you might have defended it in the past yeah so this um this would be a claim about justification right it's uh the idea would be that you know nat naturalism like is ultimately unjustified it can't it can't provide a justification for the sorts of um I, I don't know epistemic principles that it uses to defend itself or something along those lines right so we're going to say uh you know where well, we need to have something like the law of non-contradiction or identity or something in order to even state what naturalism is um but you can't give a naturalistic justification of these principles um that's the basic idea i take it i think so is it? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I think that so, so my stance on this is I'm very attracted to pretty radical kinds of skepticism. Um, I think that uh, that like ultimately maybe none of our beliefs have justification at all. Um, my problem with this sort of argument as an argument for the existence of God is I've never seen any convincing reason to think that postulating God gets out of the problem. Um, you know, I, so I, like that's that, so like, I, I yeah, I, I probably agree that naturalism doesn't have any fundamental, like basic, like fundamental basic justification, but I don't think God does either. So, uh, you know, I, I apologize <laughs> yeah. for, for, for laughing so robustly. Basically, uh, this is, this is wild because, well, it's not that wild to me, but I would, oh. I was going to leverage this into another point, which I, I'd already written down, which is, um, I'm not hope, trying to get into morality today, but on the subject of morality, this is the way a lot of these conversations have gone, that they'll assert that without a God, you have no moral absolutes, you have no objective morality at all. And that line of reasoning convinced me to stay a believer for a while. My uncle, who was a missionary, presented that to me, and I didn't have a solution. And then some one day I realized, okay, What's the problem of not having an absolute or objective standards 
that doesn't tell me anything about how good my standards are or how universally they might apply. I mean, the electrical power coming out of my walls is based on a subjective standard, which is different in the UK, but they both work and we can identify which other standards which be less efficient, more costly, more dangerous, um, and, and all those things. And I, when I used to, I toured giving a lecture on the superiority of secular morality and noted that I'm unaware of any objection to secular morality that is in any way solved by appealing to a God, even if that God exists. I don't know what that actually gets you. And so on getting kind of back to this grounding in naturalism, there are people whose view of naturalism is that anything that people are claiming is supernatural, if we were to find out what it actually is, it would just be part of the natural world. And I don't agree with that because I think even if we don't necessarily know what natural, how best to define naturalism, if we say this is natural and this is supernatural, we're talking essentially about the ontology of something. And so if we were to demonstrate that something supernatural exists, I don't see how that would make it natural. I think it would just demonstrate that we can finally identify something as beyond the natural. And, and you're right that we don't have a good definition of natural. But I'm wondering if your view is more of a natural and naturalism is such a an ill-defined fuzzy concept that anything that we would confirm would actually be folded into that somehow or if we would find something like almost a, a different ontological ontological substance like you know it, this exists outside of our universe but kind of in, in invades it i don't i don't know mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just sort of look at, I mean, also, I don't know what what decisions people would make in the future about how they classify things, obviously, but I think we can look historically at traditions that have something at least in common with naturalism. So if you look at the tradition of, you know, materialism and physicalism, um, there has been a tendency to just kind of fold the new discoveries of science uh, into that into that tradition. So, you know, I mean, like if you go back to the 1600s, the, the you know, there was a wide assumption that, um, well, in, in order to sort of count as material, uh, we're dealing with uh, essentially sort of atoms in the void, right? Like corpuscules. We're, uh, we're, we're dealing with like these concrete objects that push and pull on each other. And like, that's it. That's what the, that's what it is for something to be materialist, have like this object that's extended in space. Um, but then, you know, along comes Newtonian mechanics, which postulates these sort of weird occult forces uh, like, you know, like gravity. Right. So in, in, in the Newtonian model, gravity is just it's just a force. Um, somebody like Descartes would have tried to account for gravity by uh, treating it as vortices in uh that are created by like swirling atoms um obviously newton doesn't do that we just have this this kind of occult force um but newtonian mechanics was successful and the result was that what counts as a material thing ended up changing um and you know that sort of thing happened again with uh the development of quantum mechanics which is profoundly weird uh i mean it almost kind of incomprehensible in what it postulates uh, about what the world is like uh but we count that as you know that doesn't that doesn't sort of refute materialism it doesn't refute physicalism we just change the definition um and so i i, I guess you know in in like okay let's say we were to sort of discover that the universe has been created by a mind um i mean would that would that refute uh, naturalism I, I i don't really see why i mean like we know that there are minds right i mean i have a mind you have a mind if you're a naturalist you probably believe that there are already minds um and actually most naturalists will think that there can be all sorts of different kinds of minds because you might think that uh you know there can be uh, say different animals with very different sorts of nervous systems that have minds like octopus for instance or um you might think that there could be artificial intelligence right maybe we can have minds that are realized by silicon chips so you know if it turns out that there's some sort of great uh omniscient uh om omniscient kind of divine mind well maybe that's just another kind of mind um <laughs> uh, so i it's i don't really cool. um yeah 
I, I, I don't I don't I don't know. Like, does that count as natural? It's not it's not clear to me. I suppose we could just do it sort of we could just define it ostensibly, right? We could just say, well, look, like the natural stuff is uh, this sort of stuff, right? Like I'm pointing, I'm gesturing. It's this sort of stuff and the stuff that makes up this sort of stuff. Uh, and then uh, the idea of there being like a, like a god, right? This say agent outside the universe. Well, that would be that we're just going to count that as non-natural. And actually, I think that does have some relation to how uh things proceed in the sciences because it seems to me that there's a kind of methodological assumption uh in the sciences at least that you you sort of don't postulate god unless unless you absolutely have to and so far we haven't absolutely had to like there have been cases where people have like appealed to god to solve problems with their scientific theories um you know newton famously uh thought that well, God sometimes intervenes in order to uh, adjust things so that the solar system remains stable over long periods of time. But the attitude that pretty much all scientists have to that is like, Ugh, no, we're not doing that. Um, you know, we need to explain things by appeal to these like blind mechanistic laws, right? Not by agents, not by like divine agents building the universe in particular ways. It, it seems that there's a couple of different options here. One is that, you know, you could talk about flatlanders or, or people who perceive things, live and exist and perceive things in two dimensions, uh, trying to grasp a three-dimensional world. And so you could look at the sort of things that people um, have claimed that they've experienced and want to attribute as supernatural and say, okay, when we find out what it is, it could be that it is ultimately should be included with what we would normally normally identify as natural um it's just in in some frame of reference or at some um dimension i hate i hate using language like that that is so <laughs> sloppy but it, that we're just not able to process and so when we finally learn what it is it's it's like the things that people have asserted are supernatural if we could detect them first of all we haven't been able to actually detect reliably anything that people people pointed to as supernatural. And then we have to then figure out, okay, what sort of thing is this? Because the fact that I can detect it means that it has some impact on reality. And so there's an entire field of, of potential scientific exploration there. And if it's scientific exploration, that explains why some people are like, oh, well then obviously it's gonna be part of the natural world. But it might still be worthwhile for us to say, Here's the natural world. This is our local presentation of the universe. It doesn't include multiverses or other universes or anything like that because it, it's it's looking at this container. And if you find something that transcends that container, then it is of some other substance, even if it can interact here. And so maybe we need, maybe it's one category, maybe it's two, but what seems to me to, needs to happen first is some sort of demonstration that there's a there there, that there's, there's something there to identify and not just flaws in our thinking where, oh, I, I thought I saw a ghost and I believe that you had some experience and felt as if, uh, and, and, and potentially saw something that you would best describe as a ghost. But that doesn't mean it's a ghost and it doesn't mean we can detect it and it doesn't mean we know anything about the nature of what it did. So we gotta have some way of, of differentiating even outside of, you know, matrix. And if we just assume that you and I are sharing a world and you tell me about something you experienced, we have to have a way of saying, ah, this thing you experienced, we don't know what it is, or we do know what it is. And when we do know what it is, we can then begin to put it in a bucket. It seems premature to me to make any claim that there's something supernatural when you have no way to detect it, no way to tell what it is, no way to investigate the ontology of it or the substance of it. Um, it it's kind of like we're stuck and yet the people who are advocating for a god or ghosts or demons or anything like that how do i and this is not intended for you to to have the answer to it's my own frustration how can i or anyone else tell the difference between as arthur c clark would point out uh, a god and a really advanced technology or a ghost and something i just don't understand if there's not a current way to investigate it reliably to turn it into something akin to science. Why isn't the right answer just 
we don't know, but let's keep exploring. Uh, yeah, I, so with, just on that that first point, I mean, um, I, I, uh, I I would say that the the interesting question really is like, well, does God exist or do ghosts exist? Um, the question of whether or not they count as natural or supernatural, like you say, kind of comes a bit later, right? Like we can work out the uh, the metaphysics later. It would be very interesting to discover that God exists, regardless of what exactly we say about the metaphysical category into which he or she or it falls. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of, I would be happy to sort of put that aside and, and just like take the direct question of, well, do these things exist? Um, I mean, I think that, you know, so to be fair with, with a lot of these arguments for God, they're not, they're not necessarily empirical arguments. So, you, you know, we might think that the, empirical evidence is just not really r relevant like one one well i mean it might it might be relevant you know because there are some empirical arguments for god like the fine tuning argument and and so on um yeah or at least i guess that gets you to a designer i don't really think that that gets you to, to god uh but you know i mean like there there are <clears throat> there are more um philosophical arguments i suppose for the existence of god that wouldn't be appealing to that so i I, I guess if I mean I'm not myself religious, but uh, you, you know I suppose the answer to that to what you were saying might be well you know sure you know there's no empirical evidence that's going to decide between um, say an omnipotent being and just a very powerful being, um, but you know look I have uh, I have this philosophical case I have the cosmological argument or whatever it may be uh, which uh, which shows that there has to be a god. Um, but for what it's worth, I don't myself find uh, any of the arguments for god convincing though so you know well uh it, we've got calls queuing up and I'm, i want to make sure we get to them i have two more questions one of them i'm going to save uh, till later but there's one of them i want to touch on now um and and i almost i almost hope that i'm at, at least a little wrong or or wrong in some way um not to poison the well on your answer, but <laughs> as someone who's you know advocating for basically scientific skepticism, I, I really like to know your thoughts on the value and necessity, perhaps, of falsification. Is it possible to be rationally, reasonably justified in a belief about a fact in the material world if that fact is unfalsifiable it, this principle uh, uh this uh, within the philosophy of science that you can't have a a theory that something doesn't even count as a hypothesis for testing until it is in principle falsifiable even if it's not falsifiable in in practicality is it possible for people to have reasonable rational justification about a proposition that is not falsifiable yeah I, I so one point that's i, I mean so the way you phrase that is a bit tri tricky for me because I, I mean as i kind of hinted at earlier i'm I, i'm like i'm very attracted to like radical skepticism i i don't I, i'm not convinced there's any justification for uh, for any belief about the external world including simple things like i have hands um in fact i i just don't think there is right um so uh i i mean that's one point but um i i think it's also worth noting actually that um at least with respect to scientific theories uh the same would have been like karl popper who proposed falsificationism would have said the same thing so um you know on, on popper's view you don't ever really gain any justification for believing a scientific theory um the most that you can say is that well this theory has survived a series of very severe tests um but the fact that a theory has survived all of these very severe tests all, all that tells you is that it hasn't been falsified yet but you never have you never have any justification for believing that the theory is actually true um at least that's what popper would have said in some of his moods um let's say uh so so okay um that's 
like that's that's one point. I I think though that I mean falsificationism is you know it's it's a very useful uh, it's a useful way of like framing how we go about empirical inquiry. I think uh, so. The way that it works in science is well, we you know we present some hypothesis, we derive a prediction from it, we go out make an observation. Um, if we don't make the right observation, okay, we have to go back and modify the hypothesis. But I, I mean, that's fair enough as like a, a as a kind of abstract statement of what's going on. But I think that when you look at the the sort of details, things get a little bit more tricky. So take something like, for instance, um, so Newtonian mechanics in say the eighteen hundreds. Well, Newtonian mechanics made predictions about the orbit of the planets, and it made predictions about the orbit of Mercury. And it turned out that those predictions were false. Um, so what do you do? Do you reject Newtonian mechanics? Well, no, uh, because you can only derive a prediction from Newtonian mechanics if you also have a bunch of other hypotheses about the way the world is. So in particular, you need to have hypotheses about the distribution of mass in the solar system. Um, so when they realized that the precession of Mercury's perihelion deviated from the predictions of Newtonian mechanics, Scientists didn't reject Newtonian mechanics. They said, oh, there must be another planet there that's uh, influencing the orbit of Mercury. And then we can go out and look for this other planet. So they did. They went out and they you know, put, put their telescopes into the sky, tried to make the observations of this other planet, and they didn't find it. And so did they, you know, did they reject Newtonian mechanics then? No, they made this other uh, sort of ad hoc adjustment. And they said, well, instead of it being a planet, it must just be like a set of asteroids uh, or, or a set of like comet like things, smaller things that can't be imaged by our telescopes right now. Um, and of course, it turned out there were none of those things either. And so, you know, you, you try to make these like these like ad hoc adjustments. And of course, eventually it turned out, well, Newtonian mechanics was was wrong. Uh, uh, we replaced it with general relativity. And that accounts for the. Uh, for, for the uh, deviation in the precession of Mercury's perihelion. But the key point here is, um, like, we have a theory about the world, right? Newtonian mechanics. This says something about, you know, the, the, the laws that govern the world. And, you know, the, the, the sort of, I, I guess, like, naive falsificationist model is, oh, well, you know, you derive a prediction from it. If the prediction is false, you modify the theory. But, in fact, any theory about the world um, will only entail predictions in conjunction with a host of auxiliary hypotheses, and in fact, you can you can you can kind of you can in principle, just as sort of a logical matter, you can save almost any proposition about the world as long as you're willing to make uh, big enough changes to all of the other auxiliary hypotheses you accept, which means it's. Tricky to say if you're just talking about like a proposition. If you say, "Well, I have this proposition about the world, right? Like this thing exists, or you know, this is a law of nature, or whatever," it's very tricky to say under what conditions that would actually be falsified. Um, because what really happens is is that it's it's not so much that we you know falsify a proposition, rather we falsify like a whole web of beliefs, and then there's going to be you know, a hundred different ways that you can modify the web in order to accommodate the observation that has falsified it. Um, so that's that's sort of my line on on falsification. Is uh, it's very useful, but I wouldn't be dogmatic about it. I'll do some more thinking in that area for sure. It's one of the the things that's potentially troubling is in, in the discussions about whether or not a belief is rationally justified. There are individuals who, when backed into the corner, will basically begin to cast doubt and question reality. Whereas if I'm having a discussion with the old version of me, let's say, that used to be a fundamentalist Christian and believed in a God, um, the old me and the new me, if they were to somehow be able to have a conversation, would both have um, a package of beliefs that are very common about the world. There's 
There's information that I supposedly have about an external world that we share. I can't demonstrate that that's true, but if we begin with the, the, this basic presupposition that you and I share a world, and we talk about, let's go exploring this world, it would seem to me that the sort of hyper-skepticism that you're, you're kind of alluding to um, is almost a way of saying, every time we get to a point where we would have agreement, You'd be, you would be saying, yes, we're in agreement about what we seem to be interacting with and that you and I seem to be interacting with each other, but we, we still have to doubt reality too. And the, the theistic kind of mindset from philosophers in, in that group are that this, is, this basically dissolves everything about philosophy, about uh, logic into just absolutely being useless. And I guess that brings me to the third question, which I was going to save for later, but we've got a couple of calls and I might as well get to it now. Considering things like Curry's paradox, which we don't have to go through, but it basically mm -hmm. it's, if this sentence is true, God exists. That is a, there's nothing wrong with that other than, or that I can find or that I'm aware of anybody else finding other than that. Yes. If that sentence is true, God exists. And you could also write the sentence, if this sentence is true, God does not exist. And because you can have the exact same structure with different content, it's pointless to say that that sentence either proves God or disproves God. As a matter of fact, it, you know, I, think, I would hope that you would get laughed out of anywhere for suggesting that. And if we are dealing with things like Perry, Curry's paradox and other things like that, is logical reasoning just broken and how useful can it really be if it'd be like finding you know these people who are trying to say you know one plus four equals 18 and then they come up with a complicated proof uh, to do it and you can't find the error in it um that's worse because you can't find the error in this case you've got a rather straightforward thing with something like curry's paradox that doesn't appear to be broken and yet clearly is yeah so Cur curry's paradox curious. i uh, yeah i won't um i won't try to e explain it because it's like kind of technical but the, i mean basically the um you, you the from the very existence of a certain type of sentence um you can derive absolutely anything i mean that's basically the problem and the, the sentence is if this sentence is true then such and such so if this sentence is true then god exists from if this sentence is true, then God exists. You can use very simple principles of logic to get to the conclusion God exists. And you can do the same for any other conclusion you like. Um, and so you end up with, uh, it seems like, well, from the very, from just being able to assert a particular sentence, it turns out that every proposition is true. Um, and I mean, it's a challenge, right? Like this is certainly a, um, I, I mean, it's a big problem because the sorts of logical principles that are used in Curry's paradox are really quite simple. Um, but I, I think that, um, I mean, one thing I, I, so there's a couple of things I would say. The first is, is that, you know, there are ways around it. Um, ultimately, whenever you face an argument which entails the conclusion that like, you know, which entails like just an absurd conclusion, which entails a conclusion like, well, every proposition is true or whatever. Um, you know, you, you can always, you might think, well, look, it's always going to be more plausible for me to reject some step in that argument rather than accept the conclusion that all propositions are true. Um, or like if you, if you say, well, you know, I have this argument that, you know, that, that logic is just completely meaningless, reason is completely meaningless. Uh, you might think, look, surely it's going to be more plausible for me to just reject some step in that argument. Even if I don't know exactly which step to reject, then it is for me to accept that conclusion. Not least because if I do accept the conclusion, then I, I have to reject the argument anyway, right? Like it's kind of self-undermining in, in that sense. Um, like if I give, if I give you a, an argument to the effect that all propositions are true, then it will also be true that that very argument is invalid right so um 
So even if you can't necessarily identify exactly where the argument goes wrong, you might well say, no, it's like I, I, I'm more comfortable just assuming it goes wrong somewhere or just picking a particular inference rule and, and rejecting that. Um, and I mean, this is what I think philosophers have like have done, right? I mean, ultimately, uh, yes, Curry's paradox is a challenge, um, but the answer to that is to come up with some sort of analysis of the concept of truth or to develop, you know, alternative logics or something like, you know, it's to do that sort of thing rather than just embrace the argument. Um, and I think more, more broadly, you know, the way that I tend to look at logic at least formal logic, is that it's, you know, some people sort of look at logic as though what we're doing when we do logic is we're trying to find the kind of the principles that, uh, that like govern all of our reasoning. We're trying to find the, um, the sort of the laws that reasoning must abide by. So there's a whole bunch of different logics, right? Um, so for instance, there are some logics which do not tolerate contradictions. Um, in, in classical logic, a contradiction entails everything. But there are other logics, paraconsistent logics, uh, where you can reason with contradictions without the contradiction entailing everything. So these are rival logics. And you know, so the way that some people look at this is, well, one of these logics must be the correct one. One of these logics must tell us the correct rules of reasoning. Whereas the way I look at this tends to be more that logic is a sort of useful tool. It's a useful instrument. It's, um, you know, like we have the ability to make arguments in natural language. And then we've developed this very useful tool, formal logic, which it allows us to kind of analyze and understand those arguments. But that's as far as it goes for me. Um, so I think that some of these logical paradoxes, like, yes, they are interesting challenges, but I don't tend to think that they sort of un uh, that, that they're that effective at like undermining reasoning in general, um, because I don't think that that logic uh, or at least formal logic is is something that, that sort of governs all reasoning in general. Uh, logic is a useful tool um, that's sometimes helpful. Um, so uh, that's pretty much my take on that. Right. We've got we got some calls waiting, and by the way, if you're out there waiting to call in, there's a couple of lines open as well. Always prioritizing this. I'll tell you what I was working on that night. Who knows if I'll ever get there? I was I, mostly for my own curiosity, but maybe for a video that for my channel at some point, looking at some of the most puzzling logical paradoxes or or problems in there. What I think I've found as a common thread is um, in much the same way that you might have uh, some sort of problem catching up or, or counting how many negations there are in something. Uh, to me, most of the paradoxes that I've run across, and I was going to, I was starting to make a list of them, um, all use some sort of self-reference. Mm -hmm. So, as soon as you you refer to the argument itself or to refer to the statement itself, it's like you've opened the door to a problem that doesn't exist if you're not engaged in this in this self-referential thing. I don't know if that's a, a a trend that's actually accurate or if you're if there's a name for it or you know obviously somebody's noticed this before me. Um, yeah, absolutely. So this is this is absolutely uh, a. You know, there's this there's this neat little ling linguistic device that English has this capacity for self reference that generates a lot of paradoxes. Um, so you know, the the other, I suppose the, the sort of oldest one is probably the liar paradox. This sentence right. is false. If you right. if you try to figure out if that's true or false, you end up having to assign both true and false to it. So you end up with a contradiction. Um, and you know, one of the um, one of the most popular ways of trying to solve these paradoxes is to just ban self-reference. Uh, so um, the technical term is, um, this comes from Tarski, is uh, that there are, so, so English, uh, for instance, is semantically closed. Um, and basically a language is semantically closed if it has a truth predicate. So if it's able to say things like, you know, that sentence is true, that sentence is false. And if it has the capacity for self-reference. Um, 
So if you want to be able to, you know, talk about what's true or false without ending up with these paradoxes, well, you know, just disallow self-reference. So what you say is, is that, um, you know, when I, when I say um, something like snow is white is true, um, you, you would, you would like create a kind of distinction between these two different languages where like snow is white is true is a sentence in the higher level language talking about a sentence in the lower level language now of course like one obvious problem with this is um well that's not what english is right <laughs> like it's perfectly fine to you know construct these uh, these formal languages that are organized into a hierarchy and and so on um so that there's no self-reference fine uh but um that's not the language that we're using right now right we're using english and english does have the capacity for self-reference and so it looks like we're perfectly capable of uh, stating these paradoxes um actually the position that, that at least some philosophers have held is well it just turns out that in the english the english language is you know contradictory and inconsistent and we should just replace it uh with um with some more precise formal language uh at least when we're doing you know scientific and mathematical inquiry and so on is we uh we replace english with a uh, a consistent formal language but um yeah i mean self-reference is absolutely the source of a lot of these problems whether we can get rid of self-reference so easily i suppose is another matter all right we're going to start taking callers here. I've got a couple of, um, we've got a couple of atheist callers already on the line uh, from the web. By the way, if you are someone who wants to call in, we're going to prioritize theistic callers. We're going to, second priority is going to be anybody who has questions specifically for Kane or is stuck on some philosophical topic, anything like that. There are lines open right now, 720-619-2288. And if you look down below, you can go to callinstudio.com slash show. Uh, whoops i can't even see the entire link slash the line um and they'll you can even call in from your computer there um last little note before we get into calls as a reminder line merch is now available um if arden's got her little advertisement ready to go up you guys can see that after our mug wars from some of the previous shows the 2024 lot starting lineup is still going to be a dishwasher safe line mug and a t-shirt and the gfy ygh hoodie for those who aren't familiar gfy is uh go fuck yourself which was a reference to jimmy because he doesn't take compliments well so he said he'd rather have people just tell him that and the YGH is, uh, of course, your gay homie, which is what everybody tries to say about me. And, you know, we're going to embrace uh, the, I don't know, what, whatever love and hatred is tossed our way, we're going to embrace it and, and make the most of it. Uh, the hoodies aren't for everyone and they are limited uh, and limited edition. Uh, we really appreciate everybody's support. Even if you're not able to uh, come get merch, by all means, you can like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can go to patreon.com slash call the line. You can find a number of different ways to support what happens here on the line as we continue to bring you uh, more guests. But all of these shows are call-in shows, and we're going to jump in right now with uh, Philip, who's calling from Austria. Uh, there we go. Friends are he, him. Philip, welcome. You're on with Matt and Kane B. Although you need to turn down the background thing and pay attention to what's actually going on on the phone. All right, I don't need to hear me explaining like and subscribe. I'm going to mute Philip until he gets caught up and and realizes that it's time to grab the phone. There we go, Philip. Are you there? Who's calling from Austria? There we go. Are you there, Philip? Maybe not. We're going to put you back in the queue. Um, and we'll go to Travis from Tulsa. You're live on the line with Matt and Kane B. How are you, Travis? I'm all right, Matt. How are you today? Not too bad. Can you hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to, I just had a quick comment on what something you said last week that I totally agree with was the, uh, that you're talking about how it's people like atheists with means are not helping your cause here by doing stuff that's stupid. And uh, or they're shitty people. 
because uh, uh, I know quite a few atheists that are just horrible individuals, and I know quite a few people that are religious that are perfectly lovely, you know, but the religion doesn't help. Sorry, that was just a comment. I wasn't, I, I did have a, sorry, I'm off scatterbrain sometimes. Um, sure. But I had a, I had a, like I, what, 30 years now being an atheist or whatever, and I've, uh, like I studied the Bible, I tr- kind of like you, I didn't want to give it up when I was leaving. I'm like, so I tried really hard. And basically there was lots of different reasons that I didn't, uh, you know, logical inconsistency of the Bible just keep stacking up, stacking up and stacking up. But this one that uh, I kind of got stuck on, and I've been stuck on it for years, that I just have never really heard anybody say. And since I know you studied more than me, the Bible more than me recently, I'm sure. Um, it's, I kind of just kind of put it away and gave up. Um, but uh, is that it, say potentially that the Bible is 100 percent true? I, I know it's not true, but say like everything is true and whatever version you want to take of the 30 million different Bible versions. Um, one of the things that always stuck out to me where it started with like Moses and like the play, Moses and all the horrible stuff that God did to Egypt, supposedly did to Egypt. Um, uh, but the thing that stuck with me is, so when, I, and this is something that religious people have never been able to answer for me, like, well, not surprising, didn't really want to, um, is that in that story of Moses in multiple versions, cause I've looked at multiple versions of the Bible, it actually, you know, it like after the first thing happens, the Pharaoh is willing to let Moses go. He's like, go leave. But then it's like, but God hardens his heart or, you know, whatever phrase you want to take it. In my opinion, that's basically God taking control of him and saying, no, no, you're going to keep these people here so that I can do more horrible things to, you know, the Egyptians. And to me, I always felt that I'm like, well, wait, if God just takes control of the Pharaoh there, why can't he just take control of us to do whatever the hell he wants with us to prove his point? I, I don't think anybody would suggest that God couldn't do that. Well, no, I mean, that's, no, actually, I've had plenty of theists say, no, no, you have free will, it's free to do whatever you want. And I'm like, but well, here's the example in this book that you claim 100% is, you know, well, some people do, uh, you know, that it, you see my point is that it's like, well, if if God can just take control of people to prove a point, then does it matter what we believe? It's, it's kind of a logical you know, thing. I'm, I'm not completely sure that I fully follow. Let me, let me kind of jump in here for a second. Um, I've had a similar objection to the story of Moses and Pharaoh because what, the way the story is written, uh, it looks like God's just coming up with excuses to show off that basically, uh, Moses comes forward and, you know, here's a plague and, and Pharaoh is ready to let everybody go, but God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Um, which seems to be an overriding of Pharaoh's free will to whatever extent he would or wouldn't have it within the model of Christendom. I evidently libertarian free will works right up until God steps in. I don't think it works anywhere else, but now you've got God stepping in, but God can do from the Christian perspective and in the Jewish perspective as well, whatever the hell he wants. So to say, it's it's worthwhile, I think, to get the people who believe the Bible and think that God wouldn't do something like this to acknowledge that, okay, that happens. How do you know when or if it's happening? Uh, is it okay for God to do it just to show off? And when I was a believer still, my answer on this was, um, God already knew what was going to happen, and he knew what was going to happen with Pharaoh. And so it doesn't matter that he ultimately, you know, he hardened Pharaoh's heart rather than Pharaoh hardening his own heart. Um, it doesn't matter whether he was showing off or whatever. He had an important message to relate to everybody, which is, you know, I'm the Lord thy God. Uh, I'm the head motherfucker in charge. You know, you guys are going to do what I say, et cetera. I don't know that the objection has a lot of strength with, you know, like evangelical Christians or anything to say, ooh, well, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. 
because their view is that, yeah, that's what needed to happen for God to get this message out to people. Well, what I'm, I guess what is what I was trying to say is if you have what, let me, well, say God is doing that on a mass scale, hardening all these people's hearts, or the first, or splitting the religion in so many different ways to make it more complicated, or you know, is them like, is there a point at that point? I'm like, ha. and that was kind of where I my sticking point. Well, like, I mean, there was a lot of other things. But I'm like, wait, if he did that, then why the fuck? Like, he could be making me to have these thoughts to show a point to somebody else, you know, like type thing. That's sure. Back when I thought that. No, I think it's sorry. I was it, just... for, for the theists that are advocating for what the Bible says happens here, asking them how they know when God is manipulating someone's thoughts or not, um, is is possibly a good question. All I can do is is say what I would have said at the time, which is it's not my job to know when it's happening. It's my job to follow what God wants me to do, and uh, you know. I, right. I, I think that you get a lot of kind of they're not not platitudes sophistry based dodges I think um, when you're trying to get someone to engage with here's what the Bible says what reasonable conclusions can we reach based on it right right I mean that's <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of what I, I just like, I was like, I'm just, I don't know, that's always been a sticking point for me. I mean, there's a ton of other things, like I believe in no supernatural things whatsoever. <laughs> My wife's like, there's ghosts, like, there's no ghost. <laughs> no, See, and, and, things, and I'm in a different position. So let me, I, I don't know if, if Kane has thoughts in here on on the biblical God and, and taking over and uh, <laughs> taking someone's will, but I don't say there are no ghosts because my position is I'm not convinced there are ghosts. The burden of proof is on people who have, who've had the experience and are saying, this is what the experience is. I'm fine with somebody saying, Hey, I've had this experience. Uh, and I'm like, cool. What makes you think that it's actually a ghost? And this, right. what you hear from a lot of people right off the bat is, well, it, it, it looked like a ghost. And, and I'm like, how on earth do you know what a ghost looked like? Green, slimy, flying around, you know. It, it reminds me of people talking about their alien abduction stories because oh. how people described aliens has changed from the early days of science fiction when aliens could take a variety of different forms into a much more standardized, you know, the, the grays with the, you know, big head and almond dark eyes and you know the, the huge brain capacity everything after um uh close encounters of the third kind starts to take on that sort of presentation now is that because close encounters nailed it and took the you know the reports of a, a handful of people or is it because that's what became popular in like the cultural zeitgeist it's cause to try to force it into you know the box of logical consistency um i i would have thought that you you don't really need to because it's so easy to just say that uh the sorts of things that are being described in the bible are intended to be you know metaphorical or something like that i mean that's usually what i hear anyway when you know when, whenever i've uh, talked to people about this it seems like a lot of people will just say well you know these are these are stories they're not meant to be taken completely literally um and if you have that sort of view then um i mean that 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 it, that solves all of the problems quite nicely uh <laughs> i suppose um so yeah <clears throat> we have people who are taking it literally <laughs> in math yeah i mean it's <clears throat> i got into it with a number of different christians over the last or advocates for christianity over the last week or so if Somebody posted a meme, which I've already talked about, and I'll, I'll be very brief on this, that says uh, anti-woke is anti-Christian, period. And their reasoning for that is that their view of Jesus in this sort of esoteric sense is throw out what the Bible actually says, pick out the parts of what the Bible says that support your narrative, and you can claim that Jesus was a, a hippie socialist woke 
um, awesome person. And now you can have your queer friendly church uh, and still call yourselves Christian and nobody's got a leg to stand on to say you're wrong. The problem is if you throw out the Bible or cherry pick from the Bible, what's your foundation for Christianity? And I'm speaking at this point as someone uh, like, for example, Westboro Baptist Church, vile, oh. vile beliefs. Um, and, you know, there are members of that, former members of that family who are friends of mine. Um, and, but their view is biblical for the most part. Whereas the gay friendly church that I'm going to find in California, that's got rainbow flags everywhere and they're fine with everything LGBTQ plus, And, you know, they're, they're just awesome people who have kind of some modified version of Christianity. Their version of Christianity is much, I, I would prefer it. Like I would hang out with those people before I'd spend any time with Westboro. But when it comes down to saying, Hey, what is, what is your justification? What, what, here we are back at justification, only justification within a, a sort of Christian um, paradigm. And that is, if you go to what the Bible says, at least you've got something you can all point to and say, this is what we should be going after. When you throw that out, you, you, you know, what's the, how's that any different from everybody making up their own God? It's, it's no longer about there is a God with a message. It's, oh, this message was metaphorical which is fine. I, I'd rather live in a world where the majority of people felt it was metaphor, uh, felt it was some, you know, the, the best thoughts of ancient civilizations. But in, if, if that's the case, why not throw it out? I don't look back at the, the ancient pre-scientific um, thoughts of people who had flawed epistemologies, uh, no thoughts about testing and falsification, uh, the people who thought, you know, oh, I could tell about, you know, your, your psychology by the, the bumps on your forehead, you know, phrenology, all of these pseudosciences, it's nice to know about them. I don't need to spend time identifying with one of those pseudosciences because I find that it teaches me a metaphorical lesson. I can just get on with my day to day with what we already know. So, I end up with a problem with it no matter what, but. Right. I mean, I think, isn't, isn't there space for like a, um, a sort of, you know, mi middle path to some extent? I mean, like you could, uh, sh surely you could, it, I, I mean, look, there's the extreme position that just everything in the Bible is literally true. Um, and then the other extreme would say, well, it's just, it's all metaphor. And I think if you were to say that it's all metaphor, then you might run into problems of justification. But like, if you think, well, you know, look, there's, I mean, so some Christians, for instance, will say there's convincing historical evidence that, like, not only did Jesus exist, but that, you know, Jesus, uh, you know, there was an empty tomb and um, that this gives us evidence that Jesus was re resurrected and so on. Um, so I've seen people make this kind of empirical argument. Um, so I, I, I can sort of see someone saying, well, you know, the Bible is um, partly literal, but partly partly metaphorical. I mean, I'm sure there are like, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff in the Bible, isn't there? It would be very hard to say that, that like literally all of it is, is literal. Um, because there's, you know, there's like poetry and stuff in there. So, uh, the, the, there must be some parts that are intended to be interpreted more artistically. So I, 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 I don't know. I would have thought that would be the, yeah. The fighting mm -hmm. tends to take place over something. We, we can identify poetry and songs and there's entire books of it. Psalms. Uh, nothing, you know, songs, um, and you can look at that. But when, when the it, it's about the style in which some of it's written, and so if you're listing off a bunch of commandments that says "Thou shalt, thou shalt not," um, it, it's really hard to look at that and say, "Ooh, this is intended to be metaphorical." When it says, you know, "Honor thy father and mother," or when the Bible's advocating for putting people to death for picking up sticks on the Sabbath or doing anything on the Sabbath. Um, there's, I think, different styles of writing where uh, even in the New Testament, you'll have Jesus using a parable to tell a story. And you would point out, you know, he talks about uh, a, a king that's essentially bring my enemies before me and slaughter them. And so you can look at this and say, oh, he's just telling a story. So Jesus isn't saying to literally bring Jesus's enemies before him and slaughter him. 
But then when you look at what the story is pointing to, the story is that scenario of essentially Jesus saying, "Bring." He's he's putting himself as God in that position um, in order to justify, you know, the rest of the message. But yeah, we have no way of knowing. As soon as you say, "Here's a passage that has traditionally been read as if it is a clear message from God with some instruction: Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. If a man lies with another man as he lies with a woman, they've committed an abomination or deserving of death." Take just those two. There's nothing about those that seems to be metaphorical. There's nothing about those that seems to be poetry. Those seem to be written in the same style and and content-wise, uh, indistinguishable from, you know, don't wear mixed fabrics and don't eat shellfish, which is already bizarre that modern people tend to throw out that one about shellfish and mixed fabrics. And then it's a toss up as to whether or not they're going to keep the one about we should kill people for having gay sex. It's, I, I don't know what the solution is, but I tell you what, Travis, um, I want to move on from this because we got other callers lining up and I would love to get a theist to call in and explain how they tell which parts of their holy book should be taken literally and shouldn't. I don't know what the methodology is for deciding uh, that. I recognize that there are different writing styles um you know there's you can tell if you're reading a news item or if you're reading a storybook item but some things blur the lines and it's one of the reasons why we have so much difficulty on the internet with sites like you know the onion doing you know parody and satire uh that people believe is true and so if you're if you're a believer if you're an advocate for the bible or whatever holy book i'd love to know how you go about figuring out which parts of it you need to take literally Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks, Travis. All right. We've got uh, a very simple question. We have, uh, is it Decorus or Decorus? I don't know how to pronounce it. Oh, it's Decorus. Decorus. Calling in from Wales. Decorus. So, I mean, you're not, you're not all that far away from Kane anyway, so. Hey, I'm, I'm about as far west as you can get without um, hitting the East Coast. Well, w welcome. What's your question? Well, my my, my question is, is going to maybe a bit of a curveball because I found you guys. I, in fact, while I was waiting, I had a panic attack thinking, how the fuck did I find you guys? <laughs> and in all honesty, I really can't remember. But what I love is your absolute um, challenge for um, organized religion, quite frankly. And, you know, I, I am, if anything, an armchair cosmologist. So I'm kind of looking at Earth. Yet 3.8 billion years ago, you know, the moon smacked into the earth. Um, you know, the sun really sparked up and eventually life began. Maybe not even first on earth. Hey, of course. Could could you move the mic slightly away from your mouth? It's peaking and it's it's getting scratchy. And I want to make sure we can understand what your question is. Right, I'm going to have to move away because I've got the um, um, uh, the hands free ear things. So I'll I'll try if I speak a little lower in um, in 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 depth. Is is that a little better? Yeah, a little bit. It's still popping from from being overdriven. Uh, a bit, but I, if you can't fix it, you can't fix it. And we'll just do what we can to get the point. I just wanted to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, no, so, so my point is, is uh, the is I wonder if you guys are like myself in that having uh, trawled through all of the organized religion, understanding um, complexities of. <laughs> systems, biology, chemistry, 
quantum biology now that we have all of these understandings and yet there still is organized religion i would like to know what do you guys think what do you think is there do you think we are part of a prometheistic experiment from an outer galaxy are we you know are we part of the multiverse which is currently the only uh understanding where quantum physics and uh physics as we know it can correlate is within multiverses what are you guys thoughts on that or have i just completely fucked up your show for the evening <laughs> oh you can't fuck up the show you asked a question and i'm let's see if, if, if kane has thoughts on because you I know, know i, I you know you I, I, i'm just all of reality no, I, I, i'm just a questioning human being you know and you know i, I you know and I, I don't i don't want to discard organized religion as such but i'm i'm talking about the beginning of planet earth you know where can you take where how far can you take that kind of human imaginary far back you just can't i'm not sure well you can well you can, well, you can you because the sun on, rose a load of people on, on salisbury plain chucked up a load of stones to freeze the the wow. you know can't hear me at all sorry i've got you now yeah i i'm not sure i completely understand the question but i want to turn this over to kane and see if we can make something of it are you asking us what are our thoughts on the origins of earth um but yes because obviously okay. that would ask that that, that if, if we knew what that was that would answer all our questions physiological okay. psychological here I, I muted you because the crackling sound is driving me nuts and i want to be able to answer the question and you can't hear me trying to interrupt you so j just hold off and uh yeah huge huge question do you have thoughts so what what is what is the origin of um of, of the earth what is the origin of the universe etc um yeah i'm i'm uh pretty pessimistic about us ever actually knowing that i mean i think that um you know look we can we can sort of describe the currently accepted scientific theories i mean you know big bang model and all of that stuff um i i tend to think uh that you know the so the way that i tend to look at you know the discoveries of science is that they are a sort of useful tools for making predictions and uh systematizing observations and controlling nature um and as for the question of you know like well what what do we actually know um are these theories really true um i yeah i i, I don't think there's any good argument for that so um i yeah i'm i'm just uh sort of very pessimistic about human knowledge i think that the um origin and nature of the universe and uh, all of that just exceeds our grasp uh so that's where i am <clears throat> yeah and and i'm pretty much in a similar spot which is um i don't know um i i don't have an explanation for the origin of the universe i don't have an explanation for um the origin of life um i don't know that either of those are questions we're ever likely to be able to properly investigate i mean when you look at for example the scientific models that we have currently um i know i've mentioned before uh, Mark Lowy, who is a good friend of mine, who is now dead, but he he worked with uh, Weinberg and wrote books on quantum mechanics and was a guest on the Atheist Experience a couple of times while I was hosting as well. Uh, Mark and I had a lot of conversations about this. And I remember I would I would have some epiphany um, about, you know, something foundational within a field I do not understand, <laughs> like cosmology or quantum mechanics or whatever and i would go to him and ask and he'd be like yep that's a good question i don't know i don't know if we'll ever know and what i find is both 
most of the educated philosophy minded individuals and educated science minded individuals that I interact with are really good at saying, I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever know. And I don't know how much difference it makes because at the end of the day, people are going to propose, Hey, the best explanation for why there's something rather than nothing is God. Well, maybe the best explanation for why there's something rather than nothing is that there can't be a nothing and that, um, you know, we're, we're playing with language. If we think we can start giving nothing properties or that, you know, creation ex nihilo means that God created something out of nothing, which isn't the case anyway, because there's still a God and there's, you know, issuing forth substance there. And so if we look at all that and say, how would we tell? I don't need to know what the explanation of the universe is. I'd love to. Like, if there's a time machine, people are like, hey, what would you do with the time machine? I'm like, first thing I'm going to do is go investigate this Jesus thing. And then I'm going to go investigate the origins of life. And then I'm going to go back and, and, and hopefully witness the beginning of the universe so I can get some understanding of it. But that's mainly out of curiosity. Because my day-to-day -day life, I not only don't need to know, although I'd love to, but the people who are saying they do know haven't been able to come up with a way to reliably demonstrate that their explanation is correct. They can complain all day. Well, you don't have any, you don't have any grounding and you don't have any, you know, justification or you don't have any reason to think that you're, you, you can't even explain reality. And I'm like, neither can you. We're getting back to the same thing that I said about morality, which is you can point out objections to a secular worldview, a skeptical worldview, a rationalist, naturalist, materialist, realist worldview, whatever. Um, and people can do the same thing. I know Keynes pointed out problems with anti-realism and things like that. At the end of the day, if you're making assertions about providing an answer and you can't even say, here's the, here's the thought system under which this is justified, we can't even have a conversation. We can't even begin to argue about whether or not your path to what you call justification is similar to mine or whether yours is weaker or stronger if you don't present the justification case. So I, I guess the short answer uh, to course is that neither of us know, and I'm not so, convinced that either of us think we're likely to know, but I don't think it's a problem. Well, <laughs> oh dear. I was looking for a scientific answer. Well, oh, he hung up. He was looking for a scientific answer for Well, I, I mean there are there are scientists out there who will um, you know, be able to explain the currently accepted, you know, models of the origin of the universe and all of that stuff. So but unfortunately that's not my area of expertise. <laughs> yeah. Um so yeah. And we won't we won't say I think I think you have to be I mean one thing to to keep in mind is um you know you have to be like uh, cautious with things like uh you know inference the best explanation and sort of saying well you know we have this like really remarkable model that kind of explains everything and makes the right predictions um if you if you're doing an inference to the best explanation then presumably you've got some set of explanations right like you've got p and q and r and you're saying well you know look this one has the virtues this one makes the best this one makes predictions accurately this one is simple etc but this kind of inference to the best explanation will only lead you to the truth if the truth is among the explanations that you've considered and it, you know i think that if if you just sort of reflect on it historically it seems like human beings are pretty damn bad at like imagining all of the different possible explanations we're very bad at coming up with ways the world might be look look at how long it took for us to come up with general relativity look at how long it took for us to come up with evolution by natural selection i mean i, I like when, when i read you know evolution by like when i read you know about that it just seems so obvious it seems like well of, like of course this is like it's so simple and obvious but it took like thousands of years of uh, difficult conceptual development before somebody had that idea um so we seem to be quite bad at like exploring conceptual space 
And so I'm very skeptical that we're ever that we ever have the true explanation among the explanations that we have um, considered. Um, yeah, it reminds me uh, of the. Granted, we live in a world now where there are evidently genuine flat earthers or globe skeptics or whatever, um, and 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 it's beyond silly in that their models don't even match and explain the observations. But once upon a time when people thought the sun went around the earth rather than the earth, you know, rotating on an axis, that was not only what all of the evidence pointed to, but it was what common sense and our understanding would agree with. It was rational at some point to believe something it's, that was later found to be false, which is that the earth goes around the sun. And it takes um, this process of getting a better understanding to shift the the pool of information to where you are biased more toward you become more accurate but science doesn't make proclamations of truth and it doesn't make claims of certainty it says here's a model it's it's the best model that's consistent with the most information and sometimes there are these like in, in almost like intuitive leaps for lack of a better word where the first time you hear about evolution by means of natural selection as a model I, i'm with you it was just like a oh well obviously it's that and yet it wasn't obvious and so what is it about and and this is not a real answer because we get we've got a, a theist caller i want to get to right now but something to think about which is um i'm 54 uh before I was ever taught evolution in school, I was definitely taught some things and some things about science. But what was it if I was never taught and nobody ever discussed evolution around me, which may or may not be the case, I don't know, I don't remember things from when I was too young. Why is it that this was, that I just accepted it as obvious when it was first presented to me? Is it because I was sitting in a school and someone in a position of authority was putting it forward as this is the way things are, does that make it easier to say, ooh, that's obvious? Because it would seem that if it was truly obvious, then the first time Darwin or anybody else presented the idea to others, they would have been like, oh, of course. And yet that's not the way scientific progress works. So <laughs> on that note though, we have uh, Paul in North Carolina, pronouns are he, him. Uh, who wants to talk to us about taking scripture literally versus not literally. So welcome, Paul. Thanks for calling. Yeah. Hey guys. Um, so I, I think you had asked before, uh, just someone, some theists call in and give their take on, uh, wh you know, where they take their scripture seriously or, or literally or not literally. So I thought I'd just give you my opinion on that specifically sure. scripture. Uh, I'm a, a Protestant Christian. So, uh, you know, the Protestant Bible is the one I would be talking about, but, uh, yeah, that's why I thought I'd call in. Sure. Tell us about it. Uh, so my take on it is I, I, uh, take the Bible. I, I do what I call taking all of scripture literally, but that's literally as it claims to be taken. So, as you were mentioning before, the book of Psalms, um, that's not, it doesn't claim to be taken literally. It claims to be a book of poetry and songs. So, we take it as a book of poetry and songs. Proverbs claims to be wisdom literature. So, we take it as Proverbs as wisdom literature. But other books, uh, the Gospels, for example, or uh, Exodus, maybe, claim to be narrative. So, I take it as narrative. Um, parables I take as a parable, right? Not as like uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Don't think that actually happened, but I do think it's something that Jesus said um, as a story. Uh, yeah, so I mean, that's the base of the conversation. Um, th there are some other, you know, it, it gets tricky, like you, you mentioned somewhere in there. So uh, yeah, if you have any clarifying questions, I'd love to answer those. Well, I guess the first one is, for example, Genesis 1. How literally do you take that? Because I know people who absolutely take it literally, 
And I know people who absolutely take it as a metaphor for some sort of human fall. Uh, well, yeah, the fall being in Genesis three, but I think you're talking about creation, right? So Genesis one sure, and two. Sure. I, the, the order of events in creation, was there a God that, you know, literally day one, day two, day three, et cetera. Yeah. So actually, interestingly, this is something that I've changed my mind about as I pursue, uh, you know, learning. <laughs> and, uh, as I understand it, there are many create, uh, you know, what we would call creation myths in ancient literature. And, uh, many of them have, um, a God creating some form of creation in something like seven days. Uh, so whereas I used to take it, okay, it had to be day one, day two, day three. What I now understand is that likely it's not even like the ancient Hebrews may not have even understood it as saying that literally, but it's taking the common creation myth narrative for that time, plugging in the, the God Yahweh into that. And then basically the point being there was God, he created the earth. Um, but I think what I'm now, I, I think do I'm believe, at, I do Paul, believe in a literal Adam and Eve, which okay. I have no way of proving. Um, and, and yet, but would you, would you agree? Cause I was, I was going to interrupt to ask you specifically about a literal Adam and Eve. Um, would you agree that the best findings of science do not support the notion of a literal Adam and Eve? Yeah. So that's interesting. To me uh i i i'm okay saying i don't know uh i i because i've because i claim to take the bible literally and seriously then based on that i position myself into having to believe in a literal adam and eve um also if you don't believe in a literal adam and eve then you're inconsistent with jesus's teachings and the apostle paul's teachings so you end up having to sure claim most of the bible is not literal so yeah th uh, this is kind of what i'm getting to which this, i see you what this is this is kind of what i'm getting to because um so from the standpoint of evolution um we are great part of the great apes we can identify common ancestry we can look at the fusing of chromosome two we can have a good understanding of our lineage um, that is supported by the findings of science. And in order for there to be a literal Adam and Eve, as Genesis would, would suggest, then there would need to be some sort of either special creation at a given moment that lines up perfectly with evolution and does not leave any trace of that interjection. And yet, leads to the false conclusion that we are descendants of other hominids. And so why would a God create a literal Adam and Eve and require some sort of belief in a literal Adam and Eve while making it look like we all evolved from other great apes? Yep. That is a, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so the, be the best answer I have to that is I am open to the possibility. Um, and, and, you know, I'm trying to use this language of, uh, of not being so, so certain about things like you talk about all the time, um, though that would lead you and me in different directions because I still have a, a baseline that I'm like, well, I can say I don't know, but I, I still have to believe the Bible, which I know you disagree with. So that's fine. Uh, but I'm I'm open to old earth creationism where each day could be, you know, millions of years. And then potentially, this is only a thought that I've had in the past year or so, so it's not super thought out. But potentially there's a point where God, when it talks about God breathing life into Adam and Eve, uh, you know, make it, making Adam with his breath or whatever, I'm open to a possibility that... Um, it could be that we descended from, you know, some great ape. And then at some point God intervened and said, okay, now this is the start of like when I put a soul in a person or my special creation, whatever it may be. 
or I'm open to the possibility that uh, that science may later come to a different conclusion. Um, yeah, yeah, but but I I, I think thing. that generally speaking, I I recognize that I put myself in a hard position by by being dedicated to the biblical narrative. However, I'm still willing to do that. Um, I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something, Paul. That's going to be surprising. I'm open to old or old um, old Earth creationism old Earth creation. as well, and I'm also open to day age creationism, and I'm open to young Earth creationism, provided they're able to present sufficient evidence to warrant belief. But as it stands right now, there isn't sufficient evidence to justify any of those models over each other, and the best findings of science and the most reliable paths to understanding reality um, suggest that at n that we are just apes that um, there couldn't possibly have been a a original single Adam and Eve uh, in, in that sense and what I'm curious about I guess is you you're a nice honest chap that's uh addressing the the things that you're open to but yet you're already a believer and so it's like you're saying i'm going to believe one of these three models that isn't supported by evidence and maybe someday science will prove that one of them's right when i'm saying i can't believe any of those because there isn't sufficient evidence for it and the second that there is sufficient evidence, I'll accept them. Which one of those positions seems like it's on better foundation with regard to, you know, like reason and evidence and exploration of the world? Yeah. Uh, so I don't disagree with you that from a totally neutral outside perspective that your position uh can seem more in i don't disagree with that but uh this is what i'm saying is that and i i don't expect you to necessarily convert to my position right but i just called into you to explain my position mm -hmm. um i i basically come back to and i know you have problems with this too but essentially what I come back to is I believe uh, the scripture because of a, a large number of arguments, each of which I've seen you pull apart on the show, but um, I still agree with them. But one of them is like the historical Jesus argument. Um, and as I understand what Jesus said in the scripture, he advocates for the Old Testament scriptures and a literal Adam and Eve. So if I believe that Jesus was a real human being, he literally predicted his death, died, and rose again, and he said that the, that he was God, I believe that he was God, and then God said that all the scriptures are true. I have to believe that all the scriptures are true and bow my understanding, even through science, to that. If I believe that Jesus is God and God said that, then I have to be willing to submit my understanding and say, Maybe I don't understand it, but since I believe he's God and he said that, I have to agree with it. All right. I I don't I don't know if Kane has thoughts, but I have one last question, Paul, uh, based on what you just said. And that is, if somebody came up to you and said, I have a belief about the world that is based on a book where I'm convinced the person in the book is actually God, and that means I have to accept everything else in the book, even though there isn't sufficient evidence to believe any of the individual claims, and there's strong evidence in opposition to those claims, and yet what they were describing was something other than Jesus, what would you say to them? Well, I would understand where they're coming from, of course, I disagree because I believe that Jesus is God, so I would probably start there and say, why do you believe your character is God? I'll tell you why I believe my character is God. Let's finish the God issue first. 
and then we can go to the other claims. I think we get way too hung up on things like Genesis uh, when the first issue, which is what your shows are all about, uh, the first issue is God, and then we we uh, look at the claims of God after we think about God. Um, so that that's kind of where I'm coming from. So, so to answer your question directly, what I would say to them is, let's figure out if the guy in your book is God, or if the guy in my book is God. How do you do that? Yep. That's what you've been doing for 20 years. <laughs> so I, I don't think I'm going to convince you of anything in, in two minutes that you haven't been convinced of in 20 years. Now, here's the, but, here's the uh, thing, Paul. Here's the thing, Paul, and I appreciate this. First of all, nobody put a two minute time limit on it. Um, and yeah, I've been sitting here for 20 years. Why is it that you think, from your perspective, and there's no wrong answer here, and I'm not going to you know, throw a fucking fit. Are you convinced that I'm willing to believe in a God and that Jesus is God if there's sufficient evidence? Or do you think I'm somehow uh, opposed where nothing could convince no, I, me? No, I, I think that you believe, this is my understanding after watching your shows for some time, I, I think that you believe that if there were evidence that met your uh minimum criteria for sufficient evidence that you would believe that okay um but, but why is it the I case don't... yeah I, that, I got i got the answer to that one this i just need to get this follow-up which is yep so you acknowledge for 20 years i've been sitting here asking the same question which is how do we tell if the guy in your book is god and your answer seems to be well I've seen you keep asking that question and nobody's convincing and I don't think I'm going to be convincing. I genuinely don't understand how someone can say, I believe this, I'm going to identify with this particular religion and I'm going to hold these beliefs which are important and significant and say, when asked, how do you know they're true? Just throw up my hands and be like, well, you know, I, I can't convince you. What convinces you? Why is it? Why is it that your standards for someone claiming to be God and whether or not they are God are different from mine? Are are my standards broken or are yours broken? Or is one of them better at all? Is there a way to tell? Yeah, I mean. I would say that you probably hold a more strict standard. So uh, I, I can tell you the main reasons why I believe one of them, as I, I already mentioned, would be, uh, I feel like the evidence for a historical Jesus, and as was already mentioned in the show, the empty tomb argument, and um, the rise of the church uh, in early times, and the willingness for martyrdom, uh, the relative reliability of scripture compared to other ancient documents that we have, uh, personal experience uh, in my own life, um, this, all of these things, right, are in personal experience is one of those things that you can't impose on somebody else, but sure. the personal experiences I've had, um, all of these things are sufficiently convincing to me. And something, that, something else that I've called in about or almost called in about in the past is the role of faith. And um, I, I know that you always say, is there any position that you cannot take on faith? And if not, then it's not a reliable pathway to truth. Uh, my position on faith in the Christian tradition, or I guess in most uh, traditions, is that for me, faith, faith is not totally blind faith. Faith is the willingness to take all of this evidence that gets us almost there, but not 100% there and say, because of all the evidence together and my personal experience, I'm going to say I got 90% 90, 90 the way there on evidence. I'll, I'll take the leap for the extra 10% based on my personal huh? experience and, and the cumulative uh, arguments together. Yeah. It, it's, it's wild that, that you're willing to go to 90% because 
So I took notes on, on specifically what you're talking about, the empty tomb, the popularity and expansion of the religion, martyrdom, the reliability of scriptures, and your personal experience. So if we were to look at empty tomb, and we're not going to go through all this tonight because I got other callers and um, I, I don't want to just dig in, but you and I can have this discussion another time, by all means, call back. But it's like you say empty tomb. I'm not aware of any demonstration or any possible way to demonstrate that there is in fact an empty tomb that can in fact be linked to Jesus. There is a claim of an empty tomb. I have no way of knowing what hole in the ground anyone could point to and say, mm -hmm. this is in fact the empty tomb where they put Jesus. I, there's zero mechanism uh, to, to identify that. Then the spread and popularity of, of the religion, um, that's happened with Islam as well. There are plenty of religions that had popularity. The fact that it's persisted um, and it's the most popular um, is significant, but not a testament to its truth or likelihood. That's how, that's how appealing it is. Um, the next one was martyrdom. There are martyrs for lots of causes, and martyrdom is a, is a testimony to the strength and conviction of the beliefs of the martyrs, but not whether or not they're true. You mentioned the reliability of Scripture. I'm not aware that, that anybody can make a case for the reliability of Scripture um, with regard to, let's say, even just the Gospels, which are copies of each other, and I don't know how you go out and explore and determine that any of this stuff happened. Do you think that zombies rose up and marched on Jerusalem when the temple veil ripped, um, because that's what the book says, but nothing outside of the book suggests the dead crawled out of their their uh, graves and marched on Jerusalem, yet that's a part of this. And then you, you, you bolster it with personal experience, But and I don't know what your personal experience is, but once you start believing something and participating in a religion, um, I've had personal experiences that I used to use to bolster my Christianity as well. The, the feeling of elation um, that people would describe as being filled with the Spirit while singing and praising in church. The proposed um, miraculous healings that people have supposedly uh, experienced, and yet we don't have any way to confirm any of them. And we know a lot about how it doesn't matter which religion you're in, there's going to be miraculous healings, even from competing religions. So you've got this this thing where you you think, well, I got 90% and then I use personal experience for 10%. Uh, no offense, but I think the 90% number was a whole load of bullshit. I think that's that's an approximation that that just can't be justified. When when it's like saying the that the plural of anecdote is data, because you've got a list of anecdotes and you think you've got 90% of the way to, therefore, this is all about God. I don't I don't see it. I don't know. If, if you had anything to jump in on, Kane, but uh, I mean, look, I, I all I can say is I've, I'm not convinced by uh, any of that sort of evidence either. Um, I don't really have much of an objection to people who sort of just believe this stuff, even when they don't, by their own lights, have any justification for it. Um, I mean, I think I probably hold lots. Of, I definitely hold lots of beliefs without justification um so uh whether you know whether whether the evidence whether you like need to give evidence i suppose is, is another matter if you want to convince somebody else then you're going to need to give some sort of evidence that might be appealing to them right um i can certainly say that nobody's ever presented evidence that moves me i think with stuff like the, the trouble i always have with like things like the empty tomb and i mean i'm not an expert on this this is way outside my my field of expertise but i just feel like it, it, you know, I mean, okay, there are some historical documents that, you know, that maybe point in interesting directions there, but it just seems so, sort of so easy to say, well, you know, like may, maybe people made a mistake back then, or maybe maybe they were intentionally lying, or like there's, I mean, people lie, people make mistakes. This is very normal. I feel like those relatively normal sorts of um, uh, ordinary you know human failings can account pretty well for um you know this historical evidence um i mean i almost feel like if you think about the fact that there's uh, so many people on the planet and we've been around for so long it really isn't that surprising that there might be a few cases where 
we have historical documents that sort of seem to show that like something weird happened um so you, you know i mean yeah that that's not convincing to me <clears throat> yeah so um like like you said being short on time i think for each one of the things i listed there uh there i i would put caveats that you know we could go back and forth all day right and because I would say, well, actually what I meant by the empty tomb was this, which is a little bit different than how you took it. And then you said, well, we still, you know, still have objections with that and we could do it for every single one of those things. And maybe that's a, a call for a different time. And I'd love to call back and maybe talk through each one of those things. Um, but at the end of the day, that's why I kind of said that I, I'm willing to admit that my burden of proof is lower than your burden of proof. Um, and so I don't think I'm going to be able to convince you. And what I was really hoping to talk about, what, where I thought this was, call was going to go, was into why take this part of the Bible literally? Why take that part of the Bible literally? What about this use of the law? What about the difference between the Old Testament law and the New Testament law? What about uh, like the moral law versus the uh, the ceremonial law versus the uh, political law? or whatever, you know, all, all that type of conversation is where I was hoping it would go. That's why I kind of said, well, I, I'm willing to concede that I'm not going to convince you. I was hoping to talk more about, uh, about why, why I take certain parts of scripture literally and others not literally. Yeah. But I guess at this point, that's also a different call. Yeah. Let me I, I tell you this. First of all, huge. Thanks for the, the call, Paul. Um, if you want, you can call in Sunday. Jimmy and I will both be here. I'm happy to figure out, you know, kind of why you take certain things literally and why you don't um yeah not none of us are expecting you and i to come to agreement over the course of a call but i appreciate you calling in on this i want to get to a couple more calls before we get to super chats so yeah maybe give us a call on sunday or call me back next wednesday whichever works for us for you okay thanks matt i really appreciate it i i've been looking for a reason to call in for a long time so <laughs> i'm glad cool. i had one thanks have a good night Oh, yeah. I clicked the drop button. And so there's a delay in the audio, which is always is frustrating, especially when I'm trying to get somebody to pause for a minute so that, and they can't hear me. Um, but inevitably, I will say, oh, you know, thanks and blah, blah, blah. And I'll click the drop button. And then they will go to say one more thing or a thank you as it's dropping. And it always sounds like I hung up on people. So even though I do, um, that's not what the intent was. All right. We got a couple other uh atheist callers that we can uh try to get to here and so landon in tennessee pronouns are him um has a question about normativity to values or first order desires go ahead and ask your question landon because i'm just gonna i'm just gonna assume that this is for kane uh because i don't get it uh it's for both of you guys that's fine um it actually stems from something you quite often say about morality that uh, once you have a desire, then you can uh, have objectivity from that. But um, is there any normativity for desires in the first place? Is the kind of the question I was getting at. Are, are desires normative? That's the, the question. Yeah. Mm. I, 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 I don't think so. I mean, I think that, um, my, my view on this is that uh, just having a desire, we can always sort of step back and ask the question, well, you know, why should I have that desire? Um, like, should I have that desire? Is this a good desire to have? Um, so I think that like, just sort of, just as a matter of human psychology, right? People are motivated by their desires uh, most of the time. So like, if I have the desire for chocolate cake, then I'm gonna have like, just, what it is to have a desire for chocolate cake is to be motivated in some sense to eat chocolate cake. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, to some extent, I think the question of whether or not desires are normative is, it, it sort of doesn't matter. I mean, as long as, so when we're talking about like morality and, and ethics and so on, I mean, the question is like, well, what sorts of rules do we want people to follow, right? Um, like what, what sorts of rules should we be following? And if it turns out that like, 
the majority of people happen to agree on certain basic things, if the majority of people happen to all desire certain things, like the majority of people happen to desire, you know, food and water and peace and security and all of this stuff, well, then we can start thinking about what sorts of uh, rules and codes will tend to uh, uh, allow society to achieve those things. But I mean, you know, if, if like the question, if the question is, well, you know, does this sort of provide um, some sort of like objective normativity, right? Is is it the case that like these things are objectively good um, in virtue of our desiring them or something like that? I I, I wouldn't get on board with that. I, uh, the, I would just go as far as saying, well, you know, look, it, hey, we all we all desire these things. <laughs> And here's how we can achieve these things. Um, so let's do this. Um, and it might well be interesting in you know the context of like a more philosophical discussion to sort of step back and start reflecting on our desires. And you know we can kind of step back and we can say like, well, is it really good to have like peace, right? Or is it good to you know have pleasure rather than hey, like maybe some pain is worthwhile, right? Like I mean that's Maybe interesting, so maybe we should have the desire for a bit of pain rather than just pleasure. Um, but um, I, you know, my, my own take on that is that I, I don't think there's any objective fact of the matter which things are you know good or bad anyway. And I think that the fact that most people seem to share their desires, broadly speaking, is enough to coordinate. Um, so. I think I think that ho hopefully answers the question. Maybe uh, maybe not. Is that does that is that a, is that an answer? Is that sort of what you were getting at? Yeah, no, that's that's a good answer. Um, so, would you say the outliers that we you know put the term like evil or awful or abhorrent is? Can you kind of sum that up to? Um, I just don't prefer your behavior. That's pretty much what it amounts to for me. Yeah. I have a slightly okay. different take that, that it's it's not dramatically more robust. Um, so, and, and this is what I've described many times before. The universe operates by certain rules or there seems to be certain facts about the universe. Um, there are consequences to our actions. And if we decided that we preferred an action that like, for example, if we decided we all would prefer not to exist and then took the action that was the most expedient way for us not to exist, that would be in conflict with well-being to some extent. Maybe, you know, you could say that not existing is the best form of, of, of human well-being. But apart from that, if we're looking for what's the best way to keep living, if we're, if we're going to live in the universe, what are the best things we can do? Which things maximize, you know, our, our happiness, our health, you know, those sorts of things. There are right and wrong answers. Once you begin with, here's what I'm going to value. I don't think there's any um, imperative to, to value that. You can say, well, why should I care about human flourishing? I, I, I'm, I would never say that there's a reason for you to care about human flourishing. But kind of in line with what King was saying, I think the things that we generally would say we all agree, even though we don't all agree, but the things we would, you know, generally say we all agree on has to do with human flourishing, has to do with I'd, I want to stay alive. I'd like to live the best life I can. Um, obviously, uh, drinking an energy drink is slightly better for me than drinking battery acid, but maybe not as good as drinking water. Um, from just a raw physical health point. And I think that we can look at those things from the physical health point, from a mental health point, we're still learning and everything else. There is no, as, as far as I'm aware, normative, here's what you must, should, ought to value. Um, but there is a, as I think Kane was pointing out a little bit, there is a near consensus on what we kind of do care about whether we ought to or not. And it seems we're constantly looking at are, our, are the values we're espousing consistent with the values that we're 
clearly working towards like assuming we're not talking about people who are you know uh, interested in ending their existence then we're working towards some goal and there's people will all day long say oh i value peace i value peace i value truth i care about the truth i care about the truth and yet when you ask them okay if you care about the truth what is your method of getting to the truth setting aside whether or not truth lowercase or uppercase is is accessible you have people who believe things that the rest of us would identify as clearly obviously false you know the 2020 u.s election was not stolen the earth is not closer to being flat than it is to being an oblate spheroid um those things you know the facts about reality when it comes to our actions and, our, and the things we value i think there are similar truths to discover but not about i value human well-being i just think that we do which i think is kind of in line with with what kane was saying maybe not uh, yeah that's that's that, that's i mean pr pretty much so i mean my my stance on this ba basically is that well there just is no objective normativity um which isn't you know i mean that's a controversial position by the way like a lot of philosophers tend to be more realist about this and they'll say no there really are facts about what we ought to value um so it, it's like it's a fact that we ought to value you know peace and uh human flourishing and all of that stuff um but no i mean my I, look my stance on this is just uh, uh we we have certain basic drives certain basic desires uh and Thankfully, there seems to be enough of an, like, an agreement on those. Enough people seem to share my basic drives and desires that we're able to uh, you know, kind of coordinate in ways that allow me to achieve things that I want. Um, yeah. And I think that's enough for a, you know, a foundation for morality. Hopefully that's, a, that's an answer, Landon. I don't know if you had a follow-up. Uh, yeah, no, that, that was an answer. Uh, yeah, I have a quick follow-up. Um, sure. Why do you think there is uh, so much disagreement on this? Because it seems like most of the people that are anti-realist, they uh, they just don't get the realist positions at all, and doesn't seem to be like I've looked. There doesn't seem to be very many good arguments out there. It's hard to find realist positions, like on Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy or something like that. There doesn't seem to be very many of those. But yet, I think that it's around sixty percent of professional philosophers philosophers claim to be realists why is there so much disagreement about it you think yeah like they, they, they'll be moral realists right um yeah yeah so uh i mean there, there I, I think there is a stanford there is a stanford page on moral realism there, there i mean the arguments so i think that the um the the arguments for moral realism sort of tend to be more defensive right like so uh, I don't think it would be, um, I don't think it's, I mean, obviously I'm an anti-realist, right? Maybe I'm kind of biased here, but there's not a lot of like direct arguments for moral realism. Actually, it's not just me that says this. You can find moral realists who say it. So there's a guy called David Enoch. He's a moral realist. He wrote a book called Taking Morality Seriously. One of the things he says at the very beginning of the book is, you know, uh, uh, us realists, we're sort of lacking in, you know, direct arguments for our view and so i'm going to try to present a couple so he does that in his book he did he gives a couple of arguments for moral realism so i guess you could check out david enoch's taking morality seriously if you if you want some arguments for realism um but i mean you know i think that like the reason so the reason why so many philosophers these days are attracted to realism i think is twofold um first of all uh you, you know when we talk about like morality the the worry that motivates a lot of anti-realists is well the idea of there being these sort of objective values the idea of there being you know like things that we objectively ought to do so like you know like slavery is wrong and it's wrong not just you know like as a matter of you know opinion but it's it's like wrong objectively it's like a fact it's a property in the world it has wrongness somehow built into it that's just very weird right um and so that sort of you know there's this worry that like moral properties are just strange <laughs> uh they don't really fit into a, a sort of naturalistic um scientific worldview i mean certainly if you uh if you look at you know physics and biology and chemistry 
you're not going to find any moral properties. You're not going to find any uh, uh, facts about what we ought or ought not to do. They'll just tell you how the world is. They don't tell you how the world ought to be. Um, so, you know, one, so this is like one big worry is, okay, moral properties are really weird. One thing that has happened more recently is there's a lot of moral realists in professional philosophy who have come up with uh, all sorts of different accounts of what moral properties might be. Um, so, you know, you get, these are technical terms, moral non-naturalists, you get moral naturalists, you get uh, so-called relaxed realists who think that you can have moral truths without moral properties. There's all of these different accounts. And so one thought would be, well, we've sort of, we've kind of gotten over that problem of moral properties being weird, right? Like we've given some more robust accounts of what um, moral properties might be that show how they can fit into a naturalistic framework. Um, the other thing is that uh, there's a very popular kind of argument known as a companions in guilt argument, which would sort of sh try to show that the objections that people have to objective moral norms are also going to generalize to uh, objective epistemic norms. So we don't just talk about actions being, you know, good or, you know, justified or right or wrong. We can also talk about beliefs being kind of good or justified uh, or, or so on. You know, so I, I, I might say, for instance, um, you know, I might say, for instance, the fact that slavery causes suffering is a reason to refrain from enslaving people. Similarly, I can say, you know, the fact that I'm observing smoke above the forest is a reason to believe that the forest is on fire. And it looks like what a lot of people want to say is, is well, you know, that kind of reason, the, the smoke above the forest giving you a reason to believe that the forest is on fire, that's not just a matter of opinion. You know, that's not just a matter of what your desires are. Maybe you don't desire to believe that the forest is on fire. Maybe you have a house in the forest, so you actually have an interest in the forest not being on fire, right? You don't want to believe that the forest is on fire, but still you've observed smoke above the forest, regardless of what your desires are, that gives you a reason to believe the forest is on fire. Um, so look, that's an objective reason. Uh, so the, the, the sort of challenge would be, well, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna, gonna deny objective normativity, if you're gonna deny objective reasons, then you end up having to do away with uh, epistemic reasons as well. And a lot of philosophers don't wanna do that. Um, so I think that that probably accounts for why there are so many realists out there, uh, so many moral realists. Um, and uh, just to sort of advertise my own channel, I do have videos on all these topics. I have a very, I have a series on meta ethics, and I also have uh, videos on um, the companions in guilt argument. So if you're interested in uh, learning more, you can check those out. Um, yeah, I'm making my way through your channel. Big fan. Oh, so, I see. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Landon. Yep. Have a good day. You too. We got two more calls to get through before we're going to start uh, start in on the super chats. Any super chat over ten dollars, we're going to uh, read. And uh, let me uh, let's get to these calls. Um, I I don't know how much I'm going to add to any of this because uh, these are subjects that I've talked about a lot, and I'd rather just have the, my guest address them to some extent. But I may chime in. Um, James in New York, uh, I'm oh. I don't know if there's a typo because it says pronouns are she, he, which uh, I guess it's a preference. Maybe non-binary, gender fluid. I don't know. <laughs> preference Should for be both. she. Uh, I'm gender fluid. He? I'm Yeah, I'm, cool. I'm a gender fluid and non-binary. That's fine. I just want to make sure there wasn't a typo and you, and you actually preferred she, her. So no, yeah. fine, however you want to do it. So go ahead and ask your question. Uh, my question is this. Uh, is there any way that uh, uh, free will can be approached from a philosophical standpoint? And now I know uh, I don't agree with libertarian free will. I don't think we have any level of that. Uh, but do we have any level of free will to direct our thoughts whatsoever? Uh, and do, you, do either one of you or both of you think that our imaginations are indicative of any kind of free will whatsoever? Um, so 
I mean, you asked if it can be approached from a philosophical standpoint. Uh, well, I can I can say that like this is one of the one of the big topics in philosophy. So certainly, a lot of philosophers have talked about this. Um, I mean, I, I think that uh, like so. I I I mean, I I don't know how much you want me to how much I should say about this. Like, obviously, it's a, it is it is a big topic. Um, there are plenty of philosophers who will uh, defend compatibilist accounts on which you know you can have uh, on, on those accounts right free will is going to be compatible with uh, with determinism um i mean for, just for my own personal take on this i've i've always found the the topic of free will i, I guess in many ways i'm I, I i probably incline more towards compatibilism rather than libertarianism just because Free will is supposed to be something that matters, right? Like it's when people talk about it, they talk about it as if it's this really significant thing. It's like something that makes a difference to our everyday lives. So, you know, in terms of my, like when I judge that somebody is uh, praiseworthy or blameworthy, then the idea seems to be that this requires attributing to them a degree of free will, right? Like you're only praiseworthy for things you've actually chosen to do. Uh, so you need free will in order to make those sorts of judgments. And to me, the idea that something that is like significant to our everyday lives, the idea that that could hinge on the answer to some sort of very abstruse metaphysical question about, you know, what the world is like on a fundamental level, that just seems really strange to me, right? Like, so the idea that uh, okay, free will really matters to us, and also whether or not we have free will is going to be dependent on uh, like whether or not there are strict causal laws that fix the state of affairs in the universe right from the beginning to the end. You know, I, I just there's there's something that doesn't fit there for me. Uh, that just doesn't seem right. So I guess I would personally incline to towards a kind of compatibilism. I'd say, well, it doesn't really matter whether the universe is deterministic or not. Uh, free will. It, I would probably try to define it just if I had to define it in terms of um, uh, certain sorts of capacities that we have. So, you know, human beings, for instance, have capa the capacity to step back and reflect on their actions. Like I can think I, I can perform an action and then I can kind of say, oh, you know, should I have done that? Or I can I can think about what I'm going to do and say, well, wait a minute, let's consider some alternatives here, right? Like, okay, I'm going, I, I want to eat the chocolate cake, but hang on a minute, I also kind of want to be healthy and I know I shouldn't eat too much chocolate, so I'm going to stop myself, right? Like, clearly we have the capacity to do that, regardless of um, what the metaphysics, what the fundamental, me fundamental metaphysics of the universe is like. So uh, I would be inclined to say, that's enough for free will. That's that's what really matters. That's all you really need. Um, mm. But I also think, I mean, personally, the free will, the free will issue, to me, is not is not that. It's actually not that important to me. Like, I I, I don't really mind if if ultimately we end up concluding that free will is just uh, incoherent and there is no there is no such thing. <laughs> that's fine too. Um, I, I'm not really too bothered. <laughs> Do you think it's possible that our imaginations play a role in some part of our having free will or being indicative in that nature? Oh. Yeah, I think so, because it seems like imagination plays a role in, um, you know, in like, it, well, we imagine different scenarios, right? Like I, I kind of play out different things in my head before making decisions, um, or I, I play out things I could have done differently in the past. And it seems to me that those sorts of capacities are the kind of capacities that we care about when we attribute uh, free will to people. Like when, so if I, you know, when I hold somebody responsible for an action, um, you know, one of the things that I can say to someone is like, well, you know, if somebody does something wrong, I might say to them, hey, look, you know, you, you should have known better and you could have known better. If only you'd thought about it a little bit, uh, you could have thought about alternative ways of behaving um so you can you know we can imagine different ways that the world might be and i think that yeah that's uh, that's pretty important <clears throat> mm, mm, mm -hmm. so one more thing and this is just something i'd like to say to the both of you uh 
it's people like you, Matt, and people like you, Kane, really made me come around to accepting agnosticism and atheism as the more logical truth of the universe and the cosmos. And while though it's kind of like not necessarily a more palatable truth than the lie that religion would push off on people, kind of, I feel kind of like Cypher from the Matrix, you know, ignorance is bliss. But at the same time, I feel like Trinity, when she said to Cypher, oh, you know that's bullshit, Cypher. This, you don't accept that the Matrix is more real than this world. Yeah, I mean, the truth is better than a lie. It's, and I only, <laughs> the only reason I kicked and screamed longer than I should have was out of sentiment. But sentiment or belief structure is no reason to keep it, especially if it's not true. I, I gotta uh, say, I, I'm actually I'm I'm 100 with uh, Cipher on this one. I would absolutely get back into the Matrix, and if you offered me the choice to, to <laughs> you know get into some sort of experience machine that was better than this world, I would one I would take it in a heartbeat. Uh, give me give me blissful ignorance any day. Yeah, but that's just me. <laughs> and I am the exact opposite, and yet curiously on Newcomb's box, we're on the same page, but we don't have time to go oh. <laughs> in, into all of that. But thanks for saying that, James. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Yep, thanks, guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much, uh, I want the realest real, as harsh as it is, maybe, maybe. It's impossible to say because I'm not going to be faced well, with that decision. Out of interest. I mean, I mean, if if somebody did sort of, you know, come to you and say, well, actually, um, you're already in an experience machine. You're actually, you know, you're actually in, you know, like prison, and it's, yeah. you know, you're you're just sort of in solitary confinement. It's miserable. You, you you know, there's no there's no food. There's no clean water. It's just awful. Would you uh, would you leave? Would you say, okay, unplug me? Yeah, probably not. I, I it, so if I had uh, awareness that. Like, for example, the life I have, I'm, you know, there are ups and downs, but it's not mm -hmm. identical to me experiencing being in solitary confinement in a prison for the rest of my life. So if they pulled me mm -hmm. out and they said, hey, you're in solitary confinement, you can either stay here in this cell uh, or you can go back into the matrix, which is what I'm experiencing now. I think there would be, I, I think I would be very tempted to come back in here. Mm -hmm. And there's a part of me, so so I'm not we're not completely uh, at odds on that, but there's a part of me that would be like, okay, in this solitary confinement, it, is this scenario where there's zero chance of uh, of improvement, where I'm not actually going to learn about the real world? Um, if there was an opportunity to explore and understand that real world where it wasn't just going to be oh you get a choice between a comforting fiction and a misery fucking machine <laughs> then, <laughs> then i would probably go ahead and explore but if it's just you know hey would you like me to shoot you in the head or keep lying to you well in that case keep lying to me i think my 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 desire for, for the truth of it is still about not necessarily matrix level stuff but yeah. on the front of Brian Barczyk just died of pancreatic cancer, and I've mentioned him before. Um, he got the diagnosis ar around a year ago, and we've watched him fight this. He's a YouTuber with millions of subscribers and a and a reptile and and uh, expert in conservationist. Uh, he, he's deceased. If I had cancer, I would absolutely want to know, even if there was nothing I could do about it, because that helps me live the rest of my life. And so, on that, on those terms. That's where I advocate for truth. In a in the scenario you describe, I might not pick. I probably wouldn't pick truth if it was just going to be miserable. Right. But so maybe we're not yep. on different pages there. All right. <laughs> Final call for today, Alex in Maryland. Thank you so much for waiting. You are on with Kane and Matt. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Cheers. How can we help? Um, so this could end up being a pretty 
straightforward, quick answer um, with a one word, a one sentence answer. Um, but I've always wondered why is the search for a first cause rather than a first effect? <laughs> why um, search for a first I, cause <laughs> rather than first effect? All right, Kane, dig in. Well, my, my guess would be that the reason why people do that is because they assume that uh, effects must be preceded by causes. Uh, so, um, you know, that's like, you know, what, what, it, what it is for something to be an effect is for it to have a cause, right? Like, I mean, but I, I wonder actually what it, like, what, what would it be for something to be an effect without a cause? Uh, I mean, I can kind of imagine something happening without a cause, right? Like to me, the idea of, say, the universe just popping into existence, um, that's always struck me as being perfectly acceptable. I, I don't have a problem with that, right? So there's just, there's no cause, there's nothing, and then boom, the universe, right? That seems fine to me. So there we have something happening without a cause, right? But it would be odd to call it an effect, right? Like what, what's it an effect of? Uh, so I guess, the, yeah, the question would just be, what, like, what does it mean to have um, uh, like a first effect uh, where the, where it's a, like an uncaused effect? Maybe I misunderstood the question, but um, no, I, I yeah, I mean, right. if, if, if that was it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it comes from our biases towards our understanding of causality, which tend to be correct, but we already know of scenarios where our our understanding of causality may in fact be breaking down, or at least we're exploring those. And so, yeah, I think they look for a first cause because we're trained, ooh, cause precedes effect. If you were to like find the first effect, you'd still have a question left. But if you find the first cause, you're done. You've, you, you've, you've gotten to think, it'd be like, you know, ooh, you're, you're solving a Sudoku and, um, you know, you're not done until the last digits in there, even though you know what it is. If you found the first effect, you'd, you'd be able to easily identify perhaps uh, the cause. Uh, for there to be an uncaused event, Maybe that would be the thing to say first, to find the first event, irrespective of whether it's a cause or an effect, irrespective of, of, of a view of causality, just what's the first event. I don't think we have any hope in hell of ever finding the first anything. Um, but just, I mean, that's, that's just because we, we, we are limited. Yeah, um, the only reason, I, I completely agree that like intuitively, there should be, you know, there needs, there's a necessary cause for an effect. But I feel like when you're talking about the origin of the universe um, or of reality in general, both saying that there's a first, either of them seems non-viable as far as we understand it. Because how can you be having a, if things don't exist yet, you can't have a thing causing. Um, and this may not be completely correct. But my understanding of like how we under currently understand the universe uh, came into existence is that it's something that that is occurring. So in my mind, it would be like if the universe does exist, then it is occurring. Um, and so the effect is the universe, but that the cause would be the fact that it exists. Well, it, uh, sorry, the, the effect is the universe, the cause is the fact that it, I mean, uh, the, the effect is the universe, the cause is the fact that it exists. Those seem to be the same thing, aren't they? Like the universe, so the universe exists is the cause, and then the effect is the universe exists. Um, may, maybe I misunderstood. Um, uh, I, I'm just mean, like, usually when... I'm basically framing this in terms of how like theists generally talk about it, um, where they're looking for a first cause. And really, I was just wondering if I'm staring down like a poisoned well, um, that we are looking for a first cause because it, certain people would want that to be a god. Um, but like, if, oh, sorry. No, I don't know if this is, I'm not going to say this is accurate and, and it may or may not be helpful. I tend to look at causality as a, a, a sort of property of our local presentation of the universe. And so the space-time nest 
that is our local presentation of the universe may be different for a different universe if they're a meta level universe a multiverse thing and so it may be that causality breaks down we can't explore prior to the Planck time even mathematically without you know entering uh a territory of just raw speculation we don't have the tools to do that and so if we're going to talk about causality we can talk about it from our point of view of experience that cause precedes effect and um, that we can describe the entirety of the universe using this cause preceding effect. Um, but then we find there's this point where it breaks down, like Kane was talking about earlier with Newtonian physics. And, you know, you can use a flat earth model. A flat earth model is perfect when you're building a home or a skyscraper. You level the ground and you do all your calculations as if the earth were flat, because in the local uh, section, it is flat. What, even if you, even if you didn't expressly make it level, you can still use that. It breaks down. Um, Newtonian physics breaks down at the very, very large and the very, very small. And that's why we needed general relativity. That's why we're looking into quantum mechanics. They want a unified theory. Let's get gravity involved, all this stuff. But all of that is still about our local universe presentation. And so far, it seems like we have an understanding of time where time precedes and cause proceed or time proceeds and cause precedes effect. And so we're going to look at it like that. But as soon as we get to what about another universe? What about a multiverse? What about something outside, something that transcends our local space-time presentation? Um, I, it seems reasonable that, for example, identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle would still apply in those things. It seems reasonable even to say, oh, something akin to causality as we experience it might apply in that circumstance. I just don't know how you demonstrate it. And so rather than spending, I, I get it, the people who are looking for a first cause are convinced that there must be because they have been, they bought into an idea about the problem of an infinite regress. And I don't have, I don't have time to go into it. I'm not gonna necessarily get it right. But my view is as soon as you start looking at it as a regress, you've already, turned the world upside down for the sake of making an argument. If time proceeds from past to future, the notion of trying to go backwards in time and, and, and being worried about an infinite series of causality is already a fundamental misunderstanding because you've, you're, you're viewing it as a series of causes when you don't know that there, that that causality continues prior to the initial expansion of the Big Bang, given that model. And there may be other models um, that are more accurate than the Big Bang cosmology. Anyway, it's too much. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 might, it might just be that, the, um, that like, the correct sort of way of modeling this is just um, not available to us, like conceptually. I mean, it, it, you know, it, human beings evolved in very specific circumstances, right? Like our, our, our brains, our biological properties, right, maybe probably limit what we're able to conceptualize. And, you know, the idea that like, well, we must be able to sort of understand what, what things were like before the universe even began, um, seems questionable to me, I suppose, though, you know, in terms of like our ordinary way of conceptualizing things, we'd say there are two options, right? Like either at some point, something just came into existence, or something has existed forever. Um, I actually think both of those seem fine. I don't think there's a problem with either of those options. Um, but you know, maybe some maybe some third option that's not really even that we can't really even conceptualize is is right. So, um, so yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, so I like I think the time being unintuitive. Like when people think about like start talking about infinite regress is like very similar to why I was even asking the question because like why don't know why you would say that there's an infinite regress since we seem to understand the universe as having a finite age um and so yeah I didn't I just wanted to know if like there was any particular reason why like there seemed to be this preference for this one way of thinking about it Not, you know ignoring any like unanswerable currently unanswerable questions about like I, th I think you just answered it i i think 
the fact that <laughs> the universe as we understand it had something that can be described as a beginning whether whether it always existed in some other form or something else always existed in some other form our local presentation of the universe seems to almost certainly have a beginning and so that that meshes with our understanding of causality and when you start looking at it backwards you're going to be like oh well there must have been some first cause it it's intuitive and consistent with all of our other experiences and yet it doesn't necessarily have to be the case and even if it is the case that doesn't mean that we're going to be able to figure out what this was or i don't know i i don't want I mean, to reiterate just from a, all just, from of a, it. just from a psychological yeah. point of view right like every time something comes into existence in our experience right we we're able to identify some sort of prior event where it's like oh that caused that thing right like there's some like there's a thing that's caused me to come into existence. There's a thing that caused this glass to come into existence. So I think it's quite natural, just like psychologically, that people feel this, you know, they, they look at the model of the universe, the Big Bang model, and they feel this like pull to saying, well, there must have been something that made that happen. Um, but, you know, that might just be like a quirk of our psychology, right? Mm. All right. Um, well, I don't need, need to hold you too much longer. I really appreciate it. Um, and it's gotten me a lot to think about. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Alex. I appreciate the call. Take care. And on that note, we're going to move on to Super Chats. Let me get a couple of announcements out of the way. Um, that will also uh, give Arden time to run downstairs and get the pizza that we ordered so that you will all be jealous of the food that we're going to eat after we're, we're done with this show. But as a reminder, um, this is a call in network. This is the line you're watching the hang up on the line. It's my Wednesday night show. Tomorrow will be the transatlantic call in show with Katie Montgomery and Arden Hart talking about trans rights, trans issues with all of your questions. You get your chance to call in and talk to two real life trans people and get their view and find out where you've gone wrong or where you can do better or where they're wrong. Maybe if you found it, figure that part out. Sunday show will be me and Jimmy. And on Monday, Skep Talk will be hosted by Erica Gutsick Gibbon. Uh, I can't wait. And next Wednesday's hang up, uh, Brady Goodwin will be back to hang out with me and talk a little bit uh, about, well, whatever we feel like. But there was a very minor uh, disagreement that Brady and I had. And I think that we, we can leverage uh, the fact that he and I disagreed with some, about something and talked about it on Facebook and then moved on um, as a way of showing, hey, you know, not not all of us atheists are on the same page um, about any number of things. But here we go. Starting with Super Chats. 1999 from Greg Markowski. Uh, thanks for the show. Thank you, Greg. And normally, I'm, I'm assuming you can see these, Kane. Normally, we alternate if you're okay with oh, reading every other one. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> can can you see those um sorry i can see um so what i'm looking at is uh this is some from somebody called danny diaz yep. if mary knows all about the color that one yeah oh yeah um go ahead and, yeah go ahead and read that one uh, sorry you just want me to read that out and then yep I tell you what, okay. just, so that, just so that it's not confusing, <laughs> I'll go ahead and read them out, and if they reference you, we'll get you in it. But uh, 9.99 from Danny Diaz, if Mary knows all about the color red, then there exists some proposition P, the content of which supervenes upon the pre perception of red is knowable a priori. Um, and there's actually a follow-up here from Danny as well, which is since the content of P is supervenient to perception, P is derivable both a priori and a posteriori. Okay. Was there a was? I mean, there's no qu question there, right? Do they want to comment on that, or uh, <laughs> is I, I'm going to guess the that they want to comment. I've talked about. I, I'm generally opposed to the concept of qualia, which you're going to get from the Mary yeah, colored. This is what this sort of thing is. But um, so let's get your thoughts on qualia and Mary. Yeah, you know, I. Uh, I mean, I think that with the with the with the qualia thing, like. I, I sort of feel, I do feel the pull of it, right? Like I feel the, the intuition uh, that drives it, you know? So, so I, I have 
you know, with, with my sort of philosophical views, I find it quite fun to just, uh, you know, reject the intuition sometimes. I just say, no, this is all nonsense. But, um, you know, when it comes to these sorts of uh, arguments in philosophy of mind, I actually do, I, I, I get it. I get why people find this idea of qualia appealing. Um, but ultimately, I, um, my take on this, like my, my considered take is, um, I, I just don't see any good reason to believe in the sorts of uh, so the, the the sorts of uh, content, uh, let's say, the sorts of mental content that is uh, usually being presupposed in these sorts of arguments. Um, so I, I'd have to go back and look at exactly how he phrased that argument to uh, to to comment on it. But with you know, so okay, when it comes to qualia, right? The the assumption usually is well, this is something that is supposed to be like ineffable, private, that we kind of know like indubitably and so on. And I, I don't think there's any good reason to believe that there are such things. Um, so when it comes to the question of like, well, what is it like to see red? Uh, it seems quite plausible to me that that's just uh, something that can be, you know, that actually can be communicated with a sufficient amount of language. Um, when you look at things like the, you know, Mary's room argument, they, you know, they'll, they'll require us to say something like, well, if Mary, you know, we imagine this color scientist who knows all of the physical information um, about about color science, um, and then she discovers something when she sees red. Uh, I think if if you assume that she knows all of the physical information, like, well, what the hell would that be? Um, I, I don't think there's any good reason to suppose that she you know makes any sort of discovery or there's anything new there. Um, so, yeah, the. That, that I, is I don't know literally if that quite addresses. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that, is, that is literally what my take has been on this for years. Is that the, the only if thing you is just could... define the problem of her knowing everything about color, then by definition, she couldn't be experiencing something new because that would have to be something that she knew before because you defined it as she knows everything about color. Well, I mean, the, de the definition would be she knows everything physical that there is to know. She knows all the physical information, right? I mean, if she knows everything there is to know, then she certainly doesn't discover anything. If she knows all of the physical information, maybe she does discover something. But of course, a, phys a physicalist would just say, I think a physicalist should just say, well, no, of course, like if you know all the physical information, then there's going to be no surprises. Um, but I'm not sure whether that was quite what the uh, what Danny Diaz was saying, um, because this was more about, uh, is this... Since the content of what was the whole thing again? Could, could we go? Could, is it possible to go back? And I just want to check. I was actually responding to what they said. Yeah, I, I took it back a couple times. So in the first one, it is sorry. Yeah, you. Yeah, you so this is. If I read it. If to Mary you, knows all about the color red, then there exists some proposition P which supervene the content of which supervenes on the perception of red and is knowable a priori. Uh, right. Yeah. So this is going to be about like the meaning of. The proposition p um but why does it supervene wait a minute why does it supervene on the on the perception of red and is not this doesn't make much sense to me because when we say that something is knowable a priori we usually mean well it's knowable independently of experience um and if you're saying that the content of the proposition oh well so the content of the proposition supervenes on perception um but i, I guess you're saying it's justified a priori I'm, a li I'm, a, I'm just a little bit con confused about, I mean, I get like this is obviously connecting in some way to qualia and to the Mary's room argument, but I'm not quite sure what the connection is. <clears throat> so I guess, I guess I'll just have to leave it with what I said about qualia and Mary's room. <laughs> so it looks like I was at least in part wrong about um, the, the thought experiment. Because I thought that it was basically a declaration that she knows she has all of the information there is to obtain about what what goes on when we see ripe tomatoes. Um, but actually, it does say has all the physical information. And so then the question then becomes, is there something beyond the physical information? And there, I'm just in agreement with you. I don't know what that would be or what that would look like. All right, Danny, hope yeah, that I, answers I, I, some of that. 2536 from Whiskey Spirit Guide. Here's 20 pounds so Matt can go with Kane for a cheeky Nando's after the show. Much love, ho-ho-homies. 
Uh, it cost you more than twenty pounds. Uh, I think it'd be yeah. more like five hundred uh, for me to take a flight across the Atlantic. <laughs> no, there's no Nando's here, so I'd have to come to you. Oh, okay. Well, like yeah, five hundred for you. If then. we're actually going to go to Nando's, um, which I, I'm happy to do. I loved I loved going to Nando's while I was there. But I, I was supposed to be doing a debate um, at Oxford Union, but then COVID happened and that got postponed or or maybe shut down forever. I don't know. I haven't heard back from them. But if I do make it back to the UK, uh, yeah, there'll definitely be a handful of people that I'm looking up and I'll go for a cheeky Nando's for sure. Thanks so much, Wish Spirit God. $10 from Rule Stop Playing. Matt, what do you feel is your most potent argument against creationism if you had to pick one? I'm also looking forward to reading your book one day. Yeah, me too. If I ever get around to actually finishing a book. Um, well, it, once again, as always, it's not that you need any sort of potent argument against creationism. It's creationism doesn't have a sufficiently justifiable argument, hasn't met its burden of proof. Um, but I think pointing out that simple creationism, there's there's nothing, people try to inject their God in the gaps in our understanding, especially when it comes to the evolution of species. I don't know where, given all of the information that we have about species and their relation to each other, I don't know where there's any room to stick any God in, but the simple versions of creationism that are described in Genesis, for example, fly in the face of the scientific information, which we addressed earlier in a call today. And so I think that's probably really strong. If you want to, you know, there's, there's a bunch of absurdities where you can point out, Ooh, God's a, God's a designer, right? Then why is there the, you know, the laryngeal nerve of the giraffe go from his brain all the way down its neck around its heart, come back up. You know, that's just obvious efficiency. I don't think those are, I love them but I don't think they're as compelling to believers because it's just like, well, of course, God's gonna use similarity and design for efficiency and this stuff. And so for me, the question is the, pretty much the same one that I asked um, Paul earlier, which was, why would your God go through a creation process and intentionally make it look like it is consistent with unguided processes, um, evolution, you know, the, the, in the cosmological aspects of science, the geological aspects of science, why is it that all of that information seems to not support the notion of a special creation of a special species at a special time, either young or old? But. $20 from Dante Verona. Matt, have you ever seen The Last Temptation of Christ by Martin Scorsese? No, but I know about it. Willem Dafoe is Jesus, Harvey Keitel is Judas, and David Bowie is Pontius Pilate. Might you consider doing a Patreon video with a film review? Um, I suppose if I watched it, I don't have any plans to watch it. Maybe I could. Maybe I could start another YouTube channel that I'm not getting paid for. Where I, well, the the uh, the puzzle and the thunderstorm guys are already doing god awful movies. Um, I don't know if this one will qualify or if they've already done it, but I, I oh, might if, if they're doing, if they're doing God awful movies, it absolutely qualifies for that. It's terrible. Although I think that's a great soundtrack. Movies. Ah, yeah. I, most of their movies tend to be um, Christian films, like hmm. glurgy <laughs> propaganda stuff. But this, this might be there. There's your first review, Dante. Kane says it's crap. <laughs> $10 from Jack Schwartz. Sadly, I can't watch this show live, but I wanted to throw some support out anyways. List more snakes on Morph Market, please. Jimmy, go fuck yourself. Yeah, so for those who are interested, um, we have hatched out uh, about 70 um, baby snakes this year. There are only two currently listed on Morph Market. There are seven. There's a clutch of seven that Arden and I are moving up out of the incubator and into a rack tomorrow. Um, that includes dreamsicles and inceptions, which are orange dream dreamsicles. For those of you who don't know what the hell words I'm saying, these are phenotypic morphs of ball pythons. Um, there's another clutch of seven that is hatching literally tomorrow is the hatch date, 118. Um, and that might include gray matters. And the plan is 
for me to get um, all of the snakes that are currently available up on Morph Market in the next week or two. So I will definitely do that. Thank you, Jack. For those who aren't aware, uh, Arden and I run Epic Loot Exotics. You can go to morphmarket.com, do a search for Epic Loot Exotics, and you can see the two snakes that I have listed up there right now. $9.99 from John Kennel. How can we afford to sell atheism at such low, low prices? Volume, volume, volume. Yeah, it's free, actually. Come and, come and grasp it. $10 from Monkey to Typewriter. Here's my question, and this may be too broad to be useful. I'm a lifelong atheist, secular humanist, etc. Basically, how do I know I'm not the crazy one and the GOP actually has the right of it? Um, well, I don't think the GOP is uniform enough to actually, that would be the Republicans here in the United States. I don't think there's a, a uniformity of views within the Republicans to, to actually put them to a head. But for me, the way I the way I try to tell I'm not crazy, my here's my solution to the problem of hard solipsism for me. I cannot accept the notion that all of you are a figment of my imagination and that I've been every crappy caller to every show I've done and every person who taught me ever anything beautiful or anybody who everybody who wrote something. So the only version of solipsism left is something like a matrix where somebody's feeding a reality into my head. And I don't have good reason to think that's the case. So I'm stuck dealing with the reality that I experience, whether I like it or not. And so I try to, a la Hume, proportion my confidence in my beliefs to the actual evidence. And if it turns out I'm crazy, I, I was at least consistent, hopefully, in applying my standards of evidence to avoid falling into likely traps of deception. I don't, that's as close as I can get. How do you know you're not crazy, Kane? I am. Um, well, I, I don't, but I, uh, I I think I'm probably more um, I'm more attracted to uh, radically skeptical positions than you are because I'm quite comfortable with the idea that this is just all a dream or this is just all a hallucination. Uh, uh, I have absolutely no idea uh, how I would go about showing that that's false. It seems to me entirely logically possible. That um, well, not just logically possible. It seems just possible. Period. It seems to be entirely possible that, like, uh, I could have a series of experiences where, for instance, uh, all of this just starts kind of pixelating and then it disappears, and then I wake up and everything's completely different. And it's like, oh, oh yeah, that was all just a dream. Uh, I, I think that that's uh, you know a possible sequence of events that could happen. Um, and I, there's, I, I just don't think that despite the the best efforts of philosophers for thousands of years there's anything even approaching a good case against that um so that's basically where i am now with respect to these questions about like well how do i know that you know i'm i'm not crazy with respect to specifically uh the gop the 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 american republican party um I mean, at that point, it's like, well, as soon as you enter into the sorts of things that you're debating about when you're debating with somebody in, in the GOP, you're probably just taking it for granted that there is, you know, an external world and you're, you're probably going to be putting radical skepticism to one side, um, you know, just for the, for the purposes of, of, that, of that debate, right? Um, like, if, if as soon as you start engaging in the question of, well, you know, how should we run the country or like, is climate change actually happening? Uh, then yeah i i think at that point um you're you're at least assuming that things are as if there is an external world um yeah and so there you know i i i don't know i mean look again i i like i i could i could, I could be crazy it's uh i i know that there are remarkably sort of powerful like so for instance these days we have um uh we have, you know, algorithms and we have like, you know, pretty sophisticated uh, tools that can feed you exactly the sort of data that you want to hear, right? You can find that people end up in echo chambers and, you know, you can find yourself like, like confirmation bias is a very easy thing to, um, uh, to stimulate, let's say. Um, 
And so, you know, maybe I have made a little bubble for myself. All I can say is that, you know, I just uh, do my best to hear alternative points of view. And, um, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I just try, I just try to, you know, hear, hear different things. And very often I find that like, well, with at least some people, it's actually relatively simple to show when they're just straight up lying. Like, um, so for, for, for example, I remember that there was a, uh, there was an interview with Donald Trump where he was saying that he had a, uh, a bigger crowd at his inauguration than Obama did. And, um, you, you can, you can just like, okay, well, I, 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 let's just look at the photos. Um, like look up the photos. Clearly the crowd wasn't bigger. Uh, so, um, I don't know. I, I do the best I can, uh, with very limited resources. Yeah. I know I went off on solipsism there for a minute, but if you think about it, for example, um, within world of Warcraft, I don't think that's reality but it's a reality and there are rules within it. And so operating within the system that I experience and under the presumption that this reality I experience is real or whether it's real or not, it's the reality I'm working in. There are definitely rules and ways that, that produce more consistently reliable results in telling me about this world. That's how I can tell if somebody's lying about this world. I have no idea if there's some other world or if I wake up from a dream or whatever else. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen because I haven't seen reason to, but yeah, I, I can't rule it out. $10 from Sean Bates. We must act as if free will exists. Mm, okay, I'll, I'll take that as a charitable. Uh, our decisions affect others, and sometimes we need to hold people accountable for exercising their will because of this necessary assumption. I'm a compatibilist. Uh, I've, I'm on record as having been a compatibilist although I've softened on that a little bit, but I will say, I think we can hold people responsible irrespective of whether or not they have free will and irrespective of whether or not we believe they have free will. If my car has a, a fault, um, then I address that fault. It doesn't matter whether the car had free will or not, but I get what you're saying, John. And I think what you're, you're saying is what we care about with will is this is the agent that took the action and therefore this is the agent we're going to hold accountable. You know, I, I don't, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you're fine. Yeah, no, I, I was going to say, I, I, I don't really, I don't really know if we do like need to hold people accountable. I guess, I guess it depends on what you mean by that. If you just mean, well, you know, we need to identify things about people's behavior that we don't like in the same way that we would identify a fault in the car. And, you know, yeah, fair enough. It looks like that's something we probably want to do. But the idea of sort of praising people, blaming people, uh, the idea of uh, a kind of punishment as uh, retribution, for instance, I, I am not at all sure that those are ideas that we really should be keeping around. Um, I, 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 I mean, like, I, I'm not, I'm just not sure. Like, maybe, maybe they play some sort of really useful role, but, uh, you know, I actually can say just in my own personal life, right? Um, it's kind of liberating sometimes to just treat other people as if they are, um, well, it, as if as if they're almost just philosophical zombies, right? Uh, as as if they there's not even a mind, let alone uh, let alone no not no free will. There's just nothing going on at all. The reason why I say this is because you know it's very easy to like when you start getting into this 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 attitude of like blaming people of getting angry with people um i don't know for me that's not not necessarily a nice way to exist um and so sometimes i think look when somebody does something bad to me when somebody does something that you know would that would otherwise under normal circumstances i might blame them for and i might get angry about or or whatever um instead sort of look at it as well this is just like a you know a, a rock that fell down a hill and hit my car window right there's 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 no will there's no choice behind it there's no agent making a decision this is just like a bad thing that happened and okay now i have to deal with it um for me that's actually quite a nice place to be um i don't know maybe others would feel differently 
But I also think that when it comes to like more sort of socially, right? Okay, how do we deal with things like uh, you know crime, and how do we try how do we try to build a society where you know we have as many people who are happy as possible, and all of this, um, this framework of like holding people responsible and praising and blaming them might not be the best way of achieving that. Um, so, you know, that's where I stand. <clears throat> I think that might be the point that we're closest to strong disagreement on, but honestly, I'm not sure either. Um, I just, I just see value in, um, you know, in praise and blame. I'm, I'm not a fan of retribution or vengeance. I don't think that, uh, like, for example, prison should be viewed as a as a punishment. I think it, it should be viewed more as a, hey, this person's likely to harm other people, and so you know it's best for us to work to make sure that they're not able to harm other people. But I don't know. Maybe we can get into that at some other time. I only have two super chats left right now. Um, Way too late in the show to start digging in on whether or not we should hold anybody accountable for stuff. Nine ninety nine mm -hmm. from Secular Human is DJ here. What's the most difficult to counter pro God argument and why? I love you. Thanks, DJ. I love you too. Um, I have no idea, and I'm not going to completely dodge on this, but I am going to try to be pretty succinct. Uh, people believe for different reasons. They'll give it up for different reasons, and different arguments are going to be more convincing to different people. Um, I think probably one of the most difficult uh, to, to counter pro-God arguments is something like a first cause argument, because it, it really goes to all of our intuitions about how we normally see the world, um, about you know the order and the procession of things. And since we don't have the ability to investigate it, and since one, one of the alternatives is just to say, well, there's no initial, you know, there's no reason to think there's a first cause that doesn't really address the intuition that there is or should be. And so that's probably the one, probably what I would say is most difficult. I don't know if Kane has a different answer or not. Yeah, well, I, I guess it depends on what's meant by, um, by like countering it. I mean, does that mean, you know, like what's the most difficult? So, you know, what what's the sort of argument that most of the people who believe in God find the most convincing? Um, or is this more just like, well, which argument do I personally uh, have the most trouble with? If you're asking the question of which argument I personally have the most trouble with, um, that's a hard one, because honestly, I, I just don't find any of them even remotely convincing. Um, I, I, I mean, really, like, I, the, I, I kind of wish that I did. I wish I could be a, a little bit more like, yeah, you know, I, I can kind of see the appeal of this. But the truth is, is I, I, that there, there really is just none of them um, that, that come anywhere close to uh, to being convincing, in my view. I, I, if you if you really pushed me, if it was like gun to the head, OK, you have to pick one. Um, I, I'd maybe say something like the, the fine tuning argument. Um, may, maybe. I mean, that that's at the very least, I guess it's sort of, I don't know, it's interesting enough. It's appealing to. Uh, empirical evidence. I suppose if you could sort of, if you could get me on board with the idea of uh, inference to the best explanation, um, then I, I guess at a push, I could sort of see how well maybe a designer is is a good explanation. I don't know. Is it more a better explanation than the multiverse though? Not so even with that one, it's, it's like not really. But um, so you know, yeah, none of them are really convincing to me. If you're asking about like which is convincing to people in general, I I, I would actually think that with that sort of question, it's I, I don't think that people tend to hold religious beliefs on the basis of these sorts of philosophical arguments. I think people come to uh, religious beliefs for the, you know, for various reasons, for various other reasons, and then you know they sort of construct philosophical arguments after the fact to justify them. Um, and then if one argument gets knocked down, you just construct another one. And it's not just religious people who do this. I think, uh, you know, I think we all have a tendency to do this, right? Like re reasoning is, uh, is, is not always a matter of just like following the argument wherever it leads. Often it's a matter of constructing an argument that gets to where you want to go. 
So I'm not just blaming religious people for that. That's something that we all do. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And when I, when I listed mine, it was mainly about what I've seen over the years as being the one that, that tends to keep people on hanging the most. Um, what was it? Oh, there's a, there's a quote from somebody about, um, smart people are really good at rationalizing justifications for things they came to believe for not smart reasons. And mm -hmm. if we yeah. have been indoctrinated, we have an appeal from something. Um, it's a mistake to think that religious people are in any meaningful way, more likely to be more stupid than anybody else, because there's some incredibly smart people that are really good at rationalizing. Hey, here's a good thing. I mean, it's, you know, like you look at somebody like Alvin Plantinga, I mean, the guy's not dumb. I mean, it would be, it would be stupid mm -hmm. to suggest mm -hmm. that this is an issue of stupidity rather than um, confusion and in both the processes, uh, we're we talked earlier about logical reasoning and, and philosophy, and maybe one of these days we'll get to talk about um, the lim what the limits should be. Um, how confident we should be in some of these things, but I, say, I should just say, yeah, just to be clear, sorry, I, I, I do just want to emphasize, although I was sort of saying, you know, I don't find any of these arguments convincing. I think that a lot of those arguments are very clever. Um, I think that, you know, the ontological argument for Anselm's ontological argument is a beautiful piece of reasoning. It's completely wrong. but It's very clever and, and quite beautiful. So, you know, yeah, I, I'm not uh, putting down, you know, the uh, intelligence of, or, or whatever of, of these people. Yeah, and mm. and Plantinga basically took Anselm's uh, ontological argument and made a modal logic version of it. Mm. Um, that I, my best response, I think, to Plantinga's modal logic ontological argument is: How preposterous is it that a god would create a universe and the best? rational justification for its existence is something that less than one percent of the people will ever hear or understand <laughs> it's an interesting point On yeah <laughs> ten dollars from omar yeah god's helping you find your car keys but the only good evidence you have is a modal logic argument that didn't exist you know a hundred years ago and that you don't understand ten dollars from omar the lack of cosmic strings in the universe supposed to be predicted high energy cracks in the universe due to uneven heating cooling and none are found naturalism would predict imperfection versus theism um i i, I don't know if uh, if it's right that um that there's any conflict in the prediction of imperfection here i mean theism we know uh has to be incompatible with um sorry it has to be compatible with uh with evil, if it's true, right? So, uh, on on the sort of theist worldview, um, there 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 already is a whole load of bad stuff in the world, and I feel like if you can if you can accommodate, you know, children dying of cancer, you can probably accommodate a little bit of uh, imperfection in in the universe. So, you know, it, I I don't know if there's actually a like a that much of a difference in the prediction of uh, I mean, I don't think theism really predicts anything either way about uh, the sort of cracks in the universe. I'm not entirely sure what that's actually in reference to, but um, I don't think it really makes a prediction one way or the other. Like the, the, on a theist worldview, God could have made things so that the universe is perfect, or he could have made things so that there's uh, so that it's imperfect. It seems like he could do, he could have done both. Um, and similarly with naturalism, um, seems like you could have. A, uh, a a purely naturalistic universe that's you know governed by blind laws and blind causality and all of that stuff where it doesn't have these cracks and a uh, a, a universe governed by blind laws and causality that does have those cracks so i i just don't see any difference there yeah and we're getting close to um a discussion about possible worlds which we should definitely uh not do now but i i thanks for the super chat omar i wish hopefully 
um, that addressed it. Yeah, I'm not necessarily convinced. I, I think I can see why people would, would reach the conclusion that naturalism would predict imperfection, or more accurately, I don't know why anybody would expect perfection either under naturalism or theism, um, other than if theism is claiming that the the create the divine creator is perfect then there may be an argument to be made that it couldn't create imperfection but then there's a counter argument that it wouldn't be perfect like there would be something that it couldn't do sort of thing you'd be al almost getting into the can he create a burrito so hot he couldn't eat it sort of thing uh, i don't see that theism necessarily requires perfection even if you were to make the assumption that the deity itself is perfect. Um, it's like saying, I I can I know how to spell the word super chat perfectly, but I can intentionally misspell it if I want to. And that doesn't change the fact that I understand and can spell that word perfectly. But thus endeth the super chats. Uh, first of all, huge thank you to you, Kane, for for showing up and agreeing to do the show. I know it's uh Runs along. It's very late where you are, but uh, you seem to be a night owl up for the challenge. And uh, yeah, it's no I'm problem. I'm always always awake. Though. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. Hopefully, we can get you back, or at least have some other conversation. Or when I come over to the UK, we'll we'll go for that uh, cheeky Nando's or something along those lines. Uh, sure. <laughs> thank you to Arden for producing from down the hall and for ordering the pizza that we're going to go eat once this is over. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. Um, don't forget about linemerch.com where you can go to get a uh, new coffee cup, t-shirts, and the uh, hooded sweatshirt thing if you are so inclined. In the meantime, there's a lot to think about, and I'm going to be working on a number of different uh, philosophy 101 for, you know, newbie duffers muggles whatever uh f like myself um going through a lot of these thoughts but i really appreciate getting kane and other people in here um to give a different perspective a much more informed perspective so that people can look at these and say wow you know i've always been confused or i always thought you know this was too complicated or man this is messy and then finding out it's more complicated and messy than you could have ever hoped and everybody else is just as confused about this shit as anybody else is in the meantime, if you're a theist, don't forget about the Sunday show. Call in, be honest, give your best case, listen, interact. You can have good calls just like we had tonight explaining how and why you believe these things. Because even if we don't necessarily agree on how we would go about finding the truth, I would hope we can agree on how we can talk about how we might agree on how to find the truth. If not, we may be in an impasse forever, but that doesn't mean that my worldview or Kane's worldview or your worldview is the right one or the wrong one. That's something that we've actually got to try to establish and we may not be able to do it. But one thing I think we can do is try to help each other figure this world out as best we can. Maybe I'll cave a little to Kane's propensity for uh avoiding uh blame uh towards people more often maybe i won't you never know who knows what i'm going to do in the meantime take care of yourself don't forget to try translating call and show tomorrow at 2 p.m with katie and arden and all of the other shows coming on the line thank you guys for tuning in we'll see you next time Bye -bye. look at that list of people <laughs> what kind of stuff is this I bet they can hear me saying all this. I know they can hear me saying um, all this. So what, what, what do I do? Do I, do we, do we, do I sit here and pull it stuff? <laughs> You're doing exactly what you could be doing. Just asking what you could